The origin of the Chupacabra legend. UFO sightings in Yosemite, a giant lost Egyptian city in the Grand Canyon, another underground city supposedly inhabited by mystical Lemurians in Mount Shasta, mysterious murders, unexplained disappearances, haunted camp lodges, cursed land, the birth of a cult that exists unto this day, myths, monsters, aliens, ghosts, and more in today's cornucopia of strange National Park Mysteries edition of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. It's Time Suck time. I'm Dan Cummins. He has so many nicknames, and you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, Be Gone, Slash, Hail Lucifina, Praise Triple M, and Bojangles Long Live the Suck. Uh, big thanks to our space lizards for supporting the show via Patreon and for letting us donate $1,800 this month to Baca, Bikers Against Child Abuse. Keep hearing more and more good stories about that organization. A uh, link in the episode description if you want to donate more or just learn about this fantastic group of people uh, and, and how much they do for the victims of child physical and sexual abuse. Uh, thank you again for the recent ratings and reviews. Uh, nothing spreads the suck more than word of mouth. And the suck is spreading ratings, reviews, telling people. It spreads it so much. Uh, the Cult of the Curious, now roughly 150,000 uh, strong, according to uh, recent analytics. And we do use the strictest measuring system of any podcast analytic platform out there. So I hope I can trust those numbers. Uh, met some great time suckers on the Mediocre Time with Tom and Dan podcast crews. I was a blast. I didn't even get sick. Uh, I did sleep so much, uh, like probably 10 hours or more a day. And then still felt sick when I got home. Remember my crazy voice last week? Finally went to the doctor. Pesky sinus infection. I used to get those so often. Thought I was good the last few years. Man, those things can linger. Uh, I think the warm Bahamian weather of the cruise and some new powerful antibiotics I'm on uh, have me on the mend now. I'm not, I'm not currently sounding like Christian Bale's Batman. I have blown my nose about 7,500 uh, times today. Uh, but hopefully not going to have to stop recording 20 times during this podcast to, uh, to keep it going. Uh, heading to Florida again soon for some more tour dates. Going to be at the Off the Hook Comedy Club in Naples on Thursday night, March 28th. First time in Naples. Let's make it fun. And then the Miami Improv, Saturday, March 30th. Then I'll be at the uh, Queen of the Suck, Lindsay's hometown, Cleveland, Ohio, April 4th through the 6th. Another live Ant Hill Kid Suck in Cleveland on April 6th. Lindsay's going to be there. Uh, and Access Apparel, I forgot to mention, is going to be in Cleveland for the live suck only. Uh, they're going to be printing an exclusive shirt that you can only get at that uh, particular uh, recording of the of the live Time Suck, the Ant Hill Kids, or the, or the live performance, excuse me. They ha- they're bringing some rem- remote printing apparatus, uh, trying it out just for fun, a little bit of an experiment. So that's going to be pretty cool. Uh, Des Moines, Iowa, one night only on April 11th. Kansas City, Missouri, home of Johnny Dare. Uh, two nights, April 12th and uh, 13th. Back to Nashville. Going to be part of the Nashville Comedy Festival on the 14th. Doing a live Ant Hill Kids Time Suck at Zanies. Uh, I think right before Small Town Murder do theirs. Uh, one show only. Can't wait. Then on to the Texas Theater in Dallas, April 26th. The place the uh, John Wilkes Booth hit out right after uh, sh- supposedly shooting uh, JFK. The Secret Group in Houston on the 27th. San Francisco, Boston, Spokane, Jacksonville, and so much more coming up right around the corner. Uh, ticket info for the entire 2019 Happy Murder stand-up tour at dancummins.tv. Uh, new Danger Brain black and white classic hoodie in the Time Suck store. Uh, been a while since we added a new hoodie. I know we sold out of most of the sizes of the blue zip-up hoodie and uh, some of the sizes of the previous black zip-up. Now, now we got a, we got a, a non-zipper. No zipper, crew neck, pullover hoodie, and uh, in the ever-evolving Axis Apparel run Time Suck store. The new duds are made from the same next level 50-50 cotton poly fabric blend as the last zip-up black hoodie. Will fit the same. Uh, however, th- this hoodie is made up of uh, ground-up elderly golden retriever penis meat. Uh, you heard right. It's made up of ground-up retriever wiener meat. Why? Because we got a good deal on it. So cheap. Uh, they were practically giving that stuff away. Capitalism, baby. Capitalism. Hail Nimrod. Now let's have some fun. Let's have a lot of fun. Let's get weird. A uh, little bit of murder in today's tale. But not, but not too much. I know we've had a lot recently. This is a very different suck than the recent sucks, and I love it. A lot of different stories, little vignettes, uh, wandering around through the worlds of true crime, the paranormal, cryptozoology, folklore, and some good old-fashioned wackadoodle. Let's get silly with today's National Park Mysteries. (laughs) 
Okay, time for a little bit of trivia before I focus on mysteries in uh, four different sites within our national park system. We're going to dive deep into mysteries from the Grand Canyon, Yosemite, Mount Shasta, which is a national natural landmark, and El Yunque National Park in Puerto Rico, the only tropical rainforest protected by the U.S. Department of Interior. So how much do you know about the U.S. national parks in general? Uh, do you know how many there are? I didn't before I looked up uh, that info for this week's research. According to Wikipedia, there are 61. According to a variety of travel websites, there are anywhere from 58 to 60. Uh, according to our furry, one-eyed, three-legged pit bull and time suck mascot, Bojangles, the whole nation is one big national park for him to piss and shit on as he sees fit. Uh, for him, fences and no trespassing signs are, aren't barriers. They are uh, invitations. They're challenges. Uh, according to nationalparks.org, the website for the National Park Foundation, there are currently 60 national parks, but even that number is misleading. The United States National Park System encompasses a total of 418 different sites that span across 84 million acres, which is more land than a, than a lot of entire nations possess. Uh, the system includes parks and territories such as Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, American Samoa, and Guam. Uh, just one of America's parks, Alaska's Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve and, uh, encompasses 13.2 million acres, bigger than Yellowstone, Yosemite, and the entire country of Switzerland combined. Uh, the U.S. National Park System is, is in, in total over 10 million acres, bigger than the entire nation of Italy. Uh, within the number of 418 sites, only 60 actually include National Park as part of their proper name like uh, Acadia National Park on Maine's Atlantic coast, Everglades National Park on the southern tip of Florida, Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona, uh, Yellowstone National Park primarily located in northwest Wyoming, but bleeding into parts of Montana and Idaho. In addition to these national parks, there are 11 different national battlefields, four national battlefield parks, one national battlefield site, nine national military parks, 51 national historic parks, 78 national historic sites, and then there are national memorials, national monuments, national reserves, preserves, recreation areas, seashores, lakeshores, uh, and more. So how did all these parks get here? Well, some people uh, don't think they are here. Some people uh, think they're just lies pushed on us uh, via the moon matrix, uh, manipulated reality being projected down onto Earth, facilitated by quartz deposits and alien technology, taking the positive reality programming coming from the sun's photons, twisting them into negative reality projectors, pushing us towards war and famine and discord. Whatever turmoil feeds the Anunnaki. Those damn ancient Babylonian Brotherhood reptilian motherfuckers that have enslaved humanity for millennia. But those people are considered uh, by most academics and scientists to be utter maniacs. So let's ignore that perspective. Uh, we're going to have some fun with wackadoodles uh, who do believe in shit equally crazy to what I just said here and there throughout today's suck. And if that gibberish did make a little bit of sense to you, uh, thanks for paying attention to the David Icke stuff I've been talking about from time to time. Uh, people who live in the real world where history has not been gr grossly rewritten, where we're not being manipulated by aliens, uh, understand that the origin of our national parks can be traced back to 1872. On March 1st, 1872, then President Ulysses S. Grant signed the Yellowstone National Park Protection Act that Congress had just passed, establishing Yellowstone National Park in the territories of Montana and Wyoming as a, quote, public park or pleasuring ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people and placed it under exclusive control of the Secretary of the Interior. Uh, the founding of Yellowstone National Park introduced a whole new concept to not just the people of the United States, but to the world at large. Uh, and that's the concept of preserving land for future generations to enjoy, uh, ensuring that no one will build on it outside of the occasional guest lodge and gift shop, of course. Uh, the act began a worldwide national park movement. Today, more than 100 nations contain some 1,200 national parks or equivalent preserves, or as the act says, pleasuring grounds, uh, which sounds a little perverse today. Uh, I picture people flocking to Yellowstone to pleasure themselves around the geysers and hot springs. Uh, how was your trip to Yellowstone, Ulysses? Uh, most excellent. I was able to uh, tie my ejaculation into the delightful spray of Old Faithful. Uh, it was an exquisitely magical moment. I was also able to toss my seed into a, a few hot springs and majestic groves of massive pines as well. And Julia was able to merrily diddle herself while gazing into the grand prismatic spring while a few buffalo stopped and admired her beauty. It was quite an experience. I highly recommend uh, three out of five stars. In the years... Following the establishment of Yellowstone, 
uh, United States began to authorize additional national parks and monuments, many of them carved from federal lands in the West. These sites were also administered by the Department of Interior, while other monuments and national historic areas were administered by the War Department and the Forest Service of the Department of Agriculture. No single agency provided unified management of the varied federal parklands quite yet. On, on August 25th, 1916, President Woodrow Wilson signed the act creating the National Park Service, a new federal bureau in the Department of the Interior, responsible for protecting the 35 national parks and monuments then managed by the department and those yet to be established. Uh, the act says that the service thus established shall promote and regulate the use of the federal areas known as national parks, monuments, and reservations by such means and measures as conform to the fundamental purpose of the said parks, monuments, and reservations, which purpose is to conserve the scenery and the national and historic objects and the wildlife therein and to provide for the enjoyment of the same in such manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations to pleasure themselves with. And that is exactly what it says, minus the uh, to pleasure themselves with at the end. There was no more pleasure talk, unfortunately. Unfortunately, President Wilson wasn't uh, saying stuff like this. The stomping of the herds of buffaloes, the, the many beautiful songs of the fowl of innumerable variety, the roar of the mighty grizzly, the howl of the majestic wolf, all make for such a sweet soundtrack for the stroking and diddling of American genitalia. Do ejaculate in front of a rare protected fern or upon the face of an endangered and beloved tree frog or seldom seen crane. That will be the God-given inalienable right of every American citizen from this day forward. Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! I wish that moment had happened. Maybe it did. Maybe it did in some other parallel universe. We don't know. Hey, almost two decades later, on July 10th, 1933, new president Franklin uh, D. Roosevelt, D as in Dick, Franklin Dick Roosevelt, no, it's Delano, uh, signed Executive Order 6166 into law, allowing the president to reorganize departments that fall under the executive branch of government. Using this act, he transferred 56 national monuments and military sites from the Forest Service and from the War Department to the National Park Service. Uh, an action that was a major step in the development of today's truly national system of parks, a system that includes areas of historical as well as scenic and scientific importance. All the sites now managed by the same agency. Then in 1970, Congress reaffirmed the legality of the National Park System in the General Authorities Act of 1970, saying that uh, the National Park System, which began with the establishment of Yellowstone National Park in 1872, has since grown to include superlative natural, historic, and recreation areas in every region, and that it is the purpose of this act to include in such areas in the system. Uh, now additions to the National Park System are generally made through acts of Congress, and national parks can be created only through such acts. But the president does have the authority under the Antiquities Act of 1906 to proclaim national monuments on lands that are already under federal jurisdiction. So uh, the president can add to the national park system in that way. Uh, the Secretary of the Interior is, is usually asked by Congress for recommendations on proposed additions to the system. The secretary is counseled by the National Park System Advisory Board composed of private citizens, which advises on possible additions to the system and policies for its management. Uh, Camp Nelson National Monument in Nicholasville, Kentucky, dog folk, yeah, 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 uh, became the newest addition to the national park system on October 27th, 2018. It's 20 miles south of Lexington, and it tells the story of the African-American military service in the Union Army during the Civil War. Over 10,000 African-American troops mustered at Camp Nelson, which also offered refuge for their enslaved wives and children. Uh, Camp Nelson was the first national monument designated by President Trump. A little bit of positive political news. Who knew that was possible? Political news has, uh, has become so pervasively negative, you would think that no politician ever did anything uh, worthwhile ever uh, at all anymore. Uh, today, more than 20,000 National Park Service employees care for America's 400 plus national parks and work with communities across the nation to help preserve local history and create close to home recreational op opportunities. Uh, now, how about some random trivia? about a few specific parks before wading out into the strange and sometimes scary waters of today's National Park Mysteries. I swear we're going to get into the, the gritty shit here soon. Uh, the already mentioned Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve is America's largest park. That's the one that's 13.2 million acres, larger than the entire country of Estonia, dwarfs any of the other national parks in the continental U.S. Death Valley National Park is the largest national park outside of Alaska, 3.4 million acres. Uh, the Appalachian National Scenic Trail cuts through more states than any other land maintained by the national park system, travels through 14 states. 
uh, a 2,180 mile footpath that seems to be uh, pretty high up on the list of a lot of uh, hiking enthusiasts as far as their bucket lists go. Not me. I'll, I'll hike a little bit to see it to see a nice vista, but uh, you know maybe make it to a cool campsite, maybe make it to a, a little a little fishing area. But walking 2,000 miles just to fucking walk? No, I can think of so many other ways to enjoy a long sabbatical. Uh, none of them involve walking very far. Uh, almost all of them involve planes, automobiles, quiet beaches, and a nice bed. The Appalachian National Scenic Trail was completed in 1937, runs from Georgia to Maine. Uh, the smallest and arguably dumbest U.S. national park is the Thaddeus uh, Kosciuszko National Memorial. It's only 0.002 acres in size. And uh, making it worse, Thaddeus was Polish. And it frustrates me that we've chosen to uh, devalue our entire national park system by giving uh, any land to some fucking idiot. You know, it's terrible. Why not dedicate a park to a rat or maybe just an actual pile of shit? You know, welcome to the Hank Jackson National Park in 1982. Hank took a shit that was verified at over eight pounds and it came out in one piece. And I know that's not a great reason to start a park, but hey, uh, at least it's not fucking Polish, right? Now, new listener, please know I only make jokes like that because uh, I like to rile my Polish wife. In reality... I do have a lot of love for Poles. They know how to make a sexy lady. Hey, Lucifina. Uh, but the, the Thaddeus uh, Kosciuszko Park is real, and, and it actually is only 0.002 acres in size. Uh, the park is just a small home in a quaint location in Philly, and it is where the revolutionary Polish hero lived, and the park story encompasses his role in the revolution, how his legacy lives on in Poland and in the U.S. And his story is pretty badass. I feel like I should, we should take a quick de detour, right? Let me make some amends for all my constant Polish slander. This guy's a badass. Uh... Thaddeus Kosciuszko was born in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in 1746. The manor he was born in now sits in uh, Belarus because of shifting national boundaries. Uh, Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, they all claim him to be a national hero. Uh, he had a gifted military mind, went to a military academy in Poland, but later was unable to enlist as an officer when violence broke out in his homeland because he couldn't afford to pay the officer's commission. Back then, you had to buy your way into being an officer in war. Uh, Thaddeus had the education, but not the dough. Uh, the, he then, he then tried to fight in France as a young man, but after auditing various military classes, he, he actually wanted to enroll, but they didn't accept him because he was a foreigner and he was not able to fight as an officer because of his foreign status there as well. And then he heard about the American revolutionary war and he set sail across the Atlantic in 1776, just for the chance to fight, just for the chance to prove his valor in battle, not his war, but he, but he liked what they were doing. When he landed, he submitted an application to the second continental Congress accepted and assigned to the Continental Army the very next day on August 31st. First thing he did was to help build fortifications at Fort Billingsport in Paulsboro, New Jersey, uh, to protect the bank to the Delaware River, prevent a possible British advance up the river to Philly, and he did a hell of a job. He was originally enlisted as an officer, or excuse me, as a volunteer, but within a month had risen to the rank of Colonel of Engineers. He was put in charge of planning the defensive strategy for his army at Saratoga, uh, whose defeat of the British forces on October 1777 would prove to be a turning point in the Revolutionary War. In 1778, he was commissioned to build the military fortifications at West Point, an important defensive position on the Hudson River. Uh, considered impenetrable after he was done, the site eventually became the site of the U.S. Military Academy. By the war's end, Thaddeus was made a brigadier general, received U.S. citizenship, along with a medal for his service to the Continental Army, and then went back to fight some more. He went back to Poland to fight for his homeland, now they, now they let him fight. Now he had some dough. He fought against the Russian armies of Catherine the Great on behalf of Poland, quickly rose to commander-in-chief of the entire Polish army before being captured by Russian forces. After Catherine's death, her son respected him so much that he didn't execute him. Uh, he actually freed him, released him, uh, gave him amnesty on the condition that he just don't return to Poland. That's some respect, right? Gonna let you live, but don't ever uh, live in Poland again because I don't want to fucking fight you anymore. Thaddeus set sail for America, received a hero's welcome, became a close friend of Thomas Jefferson, and now he has his own piece of the U.S. national park system. Um, so that's a little overview of the national park system with some side knowledge about one of the best Polish people to ever live. I can only, I can only hope that my wife, Lindsay, Queen of the Sug, hears that story and just, you know, just decides for once to do something good with her life. So that's, that's really why I put that in there. Uh, the U.S. national park system covers a lot of different land in a lot of different parts of the country, employs roughly 20,000 people, and an additional 315,000 people volunteer uh, annually to keep the various monuments, battlefields, wildlife refuges, and more uh, pristine and, you know, uh, pleasurable. And teeny bit more trivia, roughly a third of America's national parklands and monuments were closed down during our recent government shutdown. 
uh, which is crazy because furloughing federal park workers caused the parks to lose roughly $400,000 a day in entrance fee revenue, laying off workers and costing the taxpayers, uh, taxpayers more money. A lose-lose. But enough tangents. Let's get to the good shit, the weird shit, the strange and sometimes spooky happenings that have gone on over the years in four of our national parks. Too many stories in too many parks to expand beyond that. Strange shit happens everywhere. Uh, you know, so some of it is bound to happen in these parks. And, and it sure did. Sure has. We're going to be talking about some juicy craziness today. Let's start with the first of four locations, the Grand Canyon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, the Grand Canyon, first famous park I ever went to as a kid. Yeah, I turned 100 last month. Happy birthday, Grand Canyon. It became a national park on February 26, 1919. The canyon is 277 river miles long. It's almost 500 kilometers, uh, up to 800 miles, or eight, up to 18 miles, excuse me, wide, 29 kilometers, and a mile, 1.6 kilometers deep. And it was the 15th site in the U.S. to have been named a national park. And just like with many frequently visited large patches of land, people have died there. Uh, any large high traffic area is going to have its share of death. Did you actually know that um, roughly 100 people die every year in Disneyland? Uh, roughly two a week. Uh, almost 50% of the deaths have occurred on Splash Mountain. Uh, do you know that uh, sometimes I lie about stuff and sometimes I make up things? Uh, actually, actually, at least nine people have actually died at, at Disneyland. This is true. Um, September 5th, 2003, I know this has nothing to do with today's story, but I had when I, once I throw that line there, I had to look for the truth. Found out that real fact and then found out this. On September 5th, 2003, a 22-year-old man, Marcelo Torres, or Marcelo Torres of Gardenia, California, died and several other guests were injured when a locomotive separated from the train along a tunnel section of Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. I'm not kidding. Torres bled to death after suffering blunt force trauma of the chest. Fuck. What a terrible place to die, right? To die on a ride uh, at a place that builds itself as the happiest place on earth. But... I am not here to try to make you scared to go to Disneyland. I'm here to try to make you scared to go to national parks or something like that. Uh, according to Grand Canyon Park spokesperson, uh, spokeswoman Kirby Lynn Shadowski, ugh, another public person, roughly 12 deaths occur each year at the Grand Canyon, including those from national causes, medical problems, suicide, heat, drowning, and traffic crashes. On average, two to three deaths per year are from actual falls over the rim. That's what she says. Uh, but Tom Myers, author of Over the Edge, Deaths in the Grand Canyon, he thinks that number is way too low. He reports that around 800 people have died in the park since it opened February 26, 1919, which would be roughly 80 deaths a year. That's a, that's a little bit more than 12. Uh, while there's quite a bit of disagreement over how many people die each year in the park, everyone agrees that people do die. And not all of them die from natural causes or from a fall over the edge when trying to get that perfect selfie, which does happen. Uh, some Darwin Awards going out every year at the Grand Canyon. Uh, a variety of murders have occurred at the park over the years. Now let's talk about Robert Spangler. 1978, Robert Spangler shot his wife Nancy and their two children to death in their suburban Denver home. And he then staged the scene to make it look as, as if Nancy killed their children in a murder-suicide. Despite his hands testing positive for gun residue and despite detectives being suspicious of Robert from the very start, the police just didn't have enough evidence to build a case against this widower. Now, what does that murder have to do with the Grand Canyon? Uh, as an isolated incident, nothing. It's his next murder that involves the park. Why we're bringing him up today. Robert would marry and kill again. 15 years later, while vacation at the Grand Canyon in 1993, his son of a bitch threw his third wife, Donna, over the edge. Just fucking threw her down the canyon. She plunged over 200 feet to her death. Detectives again were suspicious, but they didn't have enough evidence to prove anything. They could not prove that she didn't accidentally slip and lose her balance. And he got away with murder again. Then in 2000, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And an investigator, Paul Goodman, a guy who had never forgot about Robert, went to his doorstep uh, in the hopes that he just might be ready to confess what he actually did before he died. And this, uh, this investigator was correct. And Spangler conf confessed to all four murders, mostly because he wanted FBI profilers to tell him why he was so good at killing not because he fucking gave a shit about murdering his own children and two of his wives. Uh, he was sentenced to life in prison in March 2001, and then he died of cancer five months later. And, and how weird is this? Extra weird detail related to the Grand Canyon. His second wife, the only one of the three he didn't murder, wrote a book on the Grand Canyon, on foot in the Grand Canyon, hiking the trails of the South Rim before he killed his third wife. 
And I just wonder if he used his ex-wife's guide to find a good spot to throw his current wife off a fucking cliff. (laughs) My God. Uh, There have been numerous other Grand Canyon murders over the years, many of them unsolved. In January of 1977, the bodies of Michael and Charlotte Sherman were discovered after having been shot execution style. In 2006, swimmers discovered the body of a 34-year-old Japanese tourist below a waterfall. She'd been stabbed 29 times. And she and her body was reminiscent of another murder of a Japanese tourist who was stabbed to death at the south rim of the canyon several years earlier. Uh, actually, h- hard to say how many murders have been committed in the Grand Canyon because there oftentimes isn't a weapon involved. The park is the weapon. Uh, when somebody's body is found at the bottom of a cliff, hard to say if they slipped, jumped, or were pushed or thrown over. Uh, recently, on October 1st, 2018, two hikers uh, traversed a cliff about 100 feet below the south rim of the Grand Canyon. They were on what's known as a social trail, which is, you know, a trail not recognized by the National Park Service, but created over time by lots of visitors. This particular social social trail runs under the Trail View or Trail 2 Overlook, one of the park's most popular destinations. On a clear day, you can see the full expanse of the canyon from this overlook. Uh, As the two hikers made their way around the base of the cliff, they came across the bodies of a couple in what park spokesperson Carrie Cobb calls close proximity to one another. Neither of the deceased carried any identification with them, nor was there any evidence they brought a backpack, water, or other supplies. Not clear how long they'd been dead or how they died. Their bodies were eventually identified as Garrett Bonkowski, 25, Jessica Bartz, 22, both from Peoria, Arizona, a suburb of Phoenix. They'd been recorded entering the park at approximately 3.30 p.m. on September 18th. Uh, Presumably as a part of an extended road trip they were taking as they relocated to Iowa. Uh, everything else about what Bonkowski and Bart's, uh, you know, how they died on the trail, what, what they did remains a mystery that will probably never be solved. Did one push the other over the edge, then overcome with guilt, throw themselves down to their death as well? Did one fall? Did the other bravely try to save them only to fall as well? Uh, did a third party push both of them over the edge? Did they both voluntarily jump? Did they both slip? Uh, without eyewitnesses or security cam footage, you just don't know. Um, there have also been a number of deaths that were clearly suicides at the Grand Canyon. The first one I read about is, is probably the craziest suicide I have ever heard of. Uh, after watching the film Thelma and Louise more than 50 times, 36-year-old Patricia Astolfo attempted to drive her car off the rim and straight into the Grand Canyon, just like in the movie, except without the police cornering her and her being wanted for murder. Uh, She drove solo, so apparently she was not able to find a Louise to go with her Thelma. Uh, I do wonder if she tried to recruit anybody, right? That that would be a tough sell. That's a a tough friend to find. Just, oh my God, Thelma and Louise is your favorite movie too? Oh, we should totally watch it together. And then we can just drive my car into the Grand Canyon. (laughs) Yeah, okay. Yeah, we should totally do that, Patricia. Do uh, do you really want to? I'll I'll drive. Uh, I'm free to drive us over the cliff next Monday. Wait, are, are you fucking serious? No, that was a movie. Susan Sarandon. And Gina Davis didn't actually drive off a cliff. You, you know that, right? Okay, stop it, Kim. Just because you don't want to drive off a cliff with me doesn't mean you have to try to ruin my favorite movie. Uh, Patricia really did try this. Pedal to the metal, she drove straight to the edge. And then the car suspension got caught on a little outcropping of rock. Unable to drive over the edge, her car now fucked up. She could have interpreted this as a sign she wasn't supposed to die that day. Nope. She gets out of the car, walks over to the edge of the cliff, and now throws herself off. And still doesn't die. She lands 20 feet, 6 meters below, bloodied, bruised, but still alive. I think of that Austin Powers. But I'm still alive. I think it was like Will Ferrell falls down the trap door. I'm badly burned, but still alive. The second time in just a few minutes, she has now tried to kill herself. And the universe has intervened and said, hold up. Are you sure? You don't have to do this. You don't have to make this decision. It doesn't have to be so permanent. But she does. She tries a third time to kill herself. She crawls to the edge of the cliff she has just jumped down to, and, and she's so beat up, she can't even, like, like jump off. She rolls off of the cliff and now dies. Man, that is a suicide attempt that is not a cry for help. That is a scream of, I am fucking out of here. Uh, so sad. Two chances to stop and think, I shouldn't do this, but she refused to listen. And she's not the only person to uh, attempt suicide by driving your car off a cliff into the Grand Canyon. In 2009, 57-year-old George Chirac uh, checks out of the El Tovar Hotel and then drives his car straight over the edge of the South Rim, proving once and for all that men really do drive better than women. <laughs> and I know that's a terrible joke. It's tasteless. It's fucking tasteless. But come on. It, it practically wrote itself. 
I know it's sad. I know it's sad. But those two back to back, it's like it's like the ball was right there on the tee. <laughs> back in 2004, a man in his 20s committed a very unusual suicide. When he, <laughs> I know that's so messed up. Uh, I might get some emails over that one. But back in 2004, a man in his 20s committed a very unusual suicide when he jumped out of a helicopter while on a scenic tour. The other passengers described him as seeming quiet and normal before leaping into the deepest part of the canyon, 4,000 feet below. Now, and I know this is also super dark. You guys know, based on other episodes, I guess if you're a new listener, you don't know. We've donated to suicide uh, prevention charities. I'm very against it. But this already happened. Um, Would have been pretty funny if the other passengers of the helicopter would have described him as being like very impatient. Right? Like, I don't know. He seemed pretty agitated right before the jump. I mean, he said he, he forgot he made some plans with some friends uh, who hiked to the bottom. And he said he was running late. He asked the pilot to quickly take him to the bottom. Uh, when the pilot refused, uh, he just muttered like, well, fuck it then. I'll just fucking do it myself. And then he just, and then he jumped. Um, uh, <laughs> all of these deaths, I know, tragic and sad, have led to some alleged hauntings located just 20 feet, just six meters from the South Rim. The El Tovar Hotel I just mentioned was the height of luxury when it opened for business in 1905, and it's been haunted pretty much from day one, at least according to numerous guests who have sworn to have seen strange, dark figures uh, wandering about the building's rooms and hallways. Now, maybe some of the hauntings that have occurred since 1934 have to do with a dude who was buried right in front of the fucking hotel. It's a true story. Just a few feet from the building's front doors lies a flat, inconspicuous gravestone with an epitaph that reads, Pearl A. Ward, 1879 to 1934. Why would you bury somebody, bury somebody right outside the front door? Ever since the mid-30s, countless visitors and employees have claimed to see a black caped figure walking from the stairway to the gravesite before wandering off and disappearing into the woods. The cape is a weird touch. If I had to see a ghost walking to a grave, I think I'd prefer to have them not have a cape. Uh, cape makes them seem a little extra sinister, right? Who wears a fucking cape? Creeps and nuts. That's who. Can you imagine if you showed up to a first date and your date was wearing a cape? Highly doubt your reaction would be like, fuck yeah, I finally found the one. Uh, you're only thinking that if you're also some silly goose who wears a cape to places. Uh, many other visitors over the years have claimed to have witnessed a well-dressed elderly gentleman on the third floor. Some guests have even reported being invited by that man to attend the hotel's annual holiday celebration. Uh, for the last several years, the TV in the hotel's lobby will suddenly turn itself on and play Thelma and Louise if it's unplugged. Uh, always plays the scene of the car going over the cliff. And that's not true, but that would be scary if it were, right? Uh, and now, because of my bad jokes I've made, I'm kind of worried that my TV's going to do that. Uh, it, will, it will for sure be the death of this podcast if that happens, because I will, I will literally die from fright. Okay, no more Grand Canyon death. Let's get wackadoodle with my favorite Grand Canyon story so far. This is great. In April of 1909, the Arizona Gazette published a lengthy story about an explorer from Idaho yay Idaho, uh, finding a gigantic hidden city in a Grand Canyon cave. I, <laughs> I want to read you, I'm going to read you two articles about this explorer uh, and his discovery and remind you that these stories were printed in an actual newspaper, a reputable newspaper in Phoenix uh, that would go on to become the Phoenix Gazette in the Arizona Republic. Uh, this paper has been published in some form all the way from uh, 1895 to 1997. This story was presented as actual news. The first article about the man who found a lost Egyptian city in Arizona was printed on March 12th, 1909, and it says, G.E. Kincaid of Lewiston, Idaho, arrived in Yuma after a trip from Green River, Wyoming, down the entire course of the Colorado River. He is the second man to make this journey and came alone in a small skiff, stopping at his pleasure, that, that's real, that's, I didn't have that one, to investigate the surrounding country. He left Green River in October, having a small covered boat with oars and carrying a fine camera with which he secured over 700 views of the river and canyons which were unsurpassed. Mr. Kincaid says that one of the most interesting features of the trip was passing through the sluiceways at Laguna Dam. He made this perilous passage with only the loss of an oar. Some interesting archaeological discoveries were unearthed, and altogether the trip was of such interest that he will repeat it next winter in the company of friends. Man, they loved to say uh, pleasure back then, didn't they? He stopped at his pleasure, enjoying the warm touch of his own body as he floated down the cold Colorado. Uh, but seriously, nothing too interesting so far, right? Well, check out this next article. Apparently, Mr. Kincaid could not wait until next winter to bring his friends down to Arizona because he had found the coolest thing ever. Uh, this next article, published just a few weeks later on April 5th, is fucking fantastic. This is a work of wackadoodle art. 
I love that it was printed. When you hear this, try to imagine yourself reading this in Phoenix in 1909. It's a small, sun-baked desert city. Only about, only about 10,000 people at that time. It's a town based in uh, farming, largely, uh, and being a stop along the railroad, a new railroad. Uh, made it a good spot to uh, ship goods from the southwest back east. You know, imagine that you're used to reading articles about what's going on back in Washington, D.C., uh, about the construction of some new dams in the area that are going to bring more water for more crops, uh, about railroad progress, um, the passing of some locals, the births or marriages of locals, some land going up for sale, maybe an article or two about the uh, former suck subject, Pancho Villa, you know, involved in some shootouts, some, uh, some tomfoolery uh, around the Mexican border. You're used to that kind of stuff. And then one day in April, you read this shit. The latest news of the progress of the explorations of what is now regarded by scientists as not only the oldest archaeological discovery in the United States, but one of the most valuable in the world, which was mentioned some time ago in the Gazette, was brought to the city yesterday by G.E. Kincaid, the explorer who found the great underground citadel of the Grand Canyon during a trip from Green River, Wyoming, down the Colorado, in a wooden boat to Yuma several months ago. But it's weird that they said several months ago, because the article just came out the month before. But anyway... According to the story related to the Gazette by Mr. Kincaid, the archaeologists of the Smithsonian Institute, which is financing the expeditions, have made discoveries which almost conclusively prove that the race which inhabited this mysterious cavern, hewn in solid rock by human hands, was of oriental origin, possibly from Egypt, tracing back to Ramses. If their theories are borne out by the translation of the tablets engraved with hieroglyphics, the mystery of the prehistoric peoples of North America, their ancient arts, who they were and whence they came will be solved. Egypt and the Nile, the Arizona and the Colorado, will be linked by a historical chain running back through the ages, which staggers the wildest fancy of the fictionist. And then the next section says, a thorough examination. Under the direction of Professor S.A. Jordan, the Smithsonian Institute is now proceeding with the most thorough explorations, which will be continued until the last link in the chain is forged. Nearly a mile underground, about 1480 feet below the surface, the long main passage has been delved into to find another mammoth chamber from which radiate scores of passageways, like the spokes of a wheel. Several hundred rooms have been discovered, reached by passageways running from the main passage, one of them having been explored for 854 feet and another 634 feet. The recent finds include articles which have never been known as native to this country, and doubtless they had their origin in the Orient. War weapons. Copper instruments, sharp-edged and hard as steel, indicate the high state of civilization reached by these strange people. So interested have the scientists become that preparations are being made to equip the camp for extensive studies, and the force will be increased to 30 or 40 persons. Can you fucking imagine reading this? Some huge underground city has been discovered in the Grand Canyon and is connected to the Egyptians. And the writer keeps saying the Orient, which is weird. Uh, was Egypt, which is part of Africa, uh, considered part of the Orient at some point? Uh... I guess, I guess maybe by some people. So wonderfully weird. Weird. Um, okay. So he goes, he goes on. Mr. Kincaid's report, it says. Mr. Kincaid was the first white child born in Idaho and has been an explorer and hunter all his life. 30 years having been in the service of the Smithsonian Institute. Even briefly recounted, his history sounds fabulous, almost grotesque. First, I would impress, this is Mr. Kincaid now. First, I would impress that the cavern is nearly in inaccessible. The entrance is 1486 feet down the sheer canyon wall. It is located on government land and no visitor will be allowed there under penalty of trespass. The scientists wish to work unmolested without fear of archaeological discoveries being disturbed by curio or relic hunters. A trip there would be fruitless and the visitor would be sent on his way. The story of how I found the cavern has been related but in a paragraph. I was journeying down the Colorado River in a boat, alone, looking for mineral. Some 42 miles up the river from the El Tovar Crystal Canyon, I saw on the east wall stains in a sedimentary formation about 2,000 feet above the riverbed. There was no trail at this point, but I finally reached it with great difficulty. About a shelf which hid it from view from the river was the mouth of the cave, above a shelf, excuse me. There are steps leading from this entrance some 30 yards to what was. At the time, the cavern was inhabited, the level of the river. When I saw the chisel marks on the wall inside the entrance, I became interested, securing my gun, and I went in. During the trip, I went back several hundred feet along the main passage till I came to the crypt in which I discovered the mummies. One of these I stood up and photographed by flashlight. I gathered a number of relics which I carried down the Colorado to Yuma, from whence I shipped them to Washington with details of the discovery. Following this, the explorations were undertaken. If this article was written in the past few decades, I would swear that some fucking looney tune 
watched Indiana Jones movies. They, he watched them way too many times, maybe Tomb Raider. Uh, it just went crazy. Like, I love the whole, I found the coolest thing ever, but don't bother looking because the police will arrest you. They'll send you on your way to trespassing. So don't, don't come check out the coolest thing anyone's ever found. Uh, yeah, not fishy at all. And again, imagine, imagine you're sitting in some dusty saloon in Phoenix, drinking some shitty coffee, with a little whiskey, soaking in your own sweat from the devilish heat. And then you read that, you know, well, this is some humdinger of a tale. I'm, I'm going to feel like a real heel if this is just some goop's grift. And it continues, says the, uh, the passages. The main passageway is about 12 feet wide, narrowing to nine feet toward the farther end. About 57 feet from the entrance, the first side passages branch off to the right and left, along which, on both sides, are a number of rooms, about the size of an ordinary living room of today, though some are 30 by 40 feet square. These are entered by oval-shaped doors and are ventilated by round air spaces through the walls into passages. The walls are about three feet, six inches in thickness. The passages are chiseled or hewn as straight as can be laid out by an engineer. The ceilings of the many of the, roo uh, many of the rooms converge to a center. The side passages near the entrance run at a sharp angle from the main hall, but toward the rear they gradually reach a right angle in direction. The shrine. Over a hundred feet from the entrance is the cross hall, several hundred feet long, in which are found the idol or image of the people's god, sitting cross-legged with a lotus flower or lily in each hand. The cast of the face is oriental, and the carving this cavern. Uh, the idol almost resembles Buddha, though the scientists are not certain as to what religious worship it represents. Taking into consideration everything found thus far, it is possible that this worship most resembles the ancient people of Tibet. Okay, so it's not Egyptian. Uh, maybe it's some ancient culture that spawned the Egyptians. It's probably Atlantis. Probably. Probably Atlantis. Surrounding this idol are smaller images, some very beautiful in form, others crooked-necked and distorted shapes, symbolical, probably of good and evil. There are two large cactus with protruding arms, one on each side of the dais on which the god squats. Huh. So it's a weird cactus god that is also Tibetan and is also Egyptian. You know what? It almost seems like he's making all of this shit up. All this is carved out of hard rock resembling marble. Oh, we got fucking marble now in the Grand Canyon. In the opposite corner of this cross hall were found tools of all descriptions made of copper. These people undoubtedly knew the lost art of hardening this metal, which has been sought by chemicals for centuries without result. On a bench running around the workroom was some charcoal and other material probably used in the process. There is also slag and stuff similar to mat, showing that these ancient smelted ores, but uh, so far no trace of where or how this was done or has been discovered nor the origin of the ore. Among the other finds are vases or urns, cups of copper and gold, made very artistic in design. The pottery work includes enameled ware and glazed vessels. Another passageway leads to granaries, such as those that are found in the Oriental temples. They contain seeds of various kind. Yeah, bullshit seeds. Uh, one very large storehouse has not yet been entered, as it is 12 feet high and can be reached only from above. Two copper hooks extend on the edge, which indicate that some sort of ladder was attached. These granaries are rounded, as the materials of which they are constructed, I think is a very hard cement. A gray metal is also found in this cavern, which puzzles the scientists, for its identity has not been established. It resembles platinum. Strewn promiscuously over the floor everywhere are what people call cat's eyes. A yellow stone of no great value, each one is engraved with the head of a Malay type. The hieroglyphics. On all the urns or walls over doorways, the tablets of stone which were found by the image are the mysterious hieroglyphics, the key to which the Smithsonian Institute hopes yet to discover. The engraving on the tables probably has something to do with the religion of the people. Similar hieroglyphics have been found in southern Arizona. Among the pictorial writings, only two animals are found. One is of prehistoric type, the crypt. The tomb or crypt in which the mummies were found is one of the largest of the chambers, the walls slanting back at an angle of about 35 degrees. On these are tiers of mummies, each one occupying a, occupying a separate hewn shelf. At the head of each is a small bench on which is found copper cups and pieces of broken swords. Some of the mummies are covered with clay and all are wrapped in bark fabric. The urns or cups on the lower tiers are crude. While as the higher shelves are reached, the urns are finer in design, showing a later stage of civilization. It is worthy of note that all the mummies examined so far proved to be male, no children or females being buried. This leads to the belief that the exterior section was the warrior's barracks. Among the discoveries, no bones of animals have been found, no skins, no clothing, no bedding. Many of the rooms are bare, but for the water vessels, 
One room about 40 by 700 feet was probably the main dining hall for cooking utensils have been found. What these people lived on is a problem. Though it is presumed, yeah, it is a problem when you're fucking making all this shit up. Though it is presumed that they came south in the winter and farmed in the valleys going back north in the summer. Upwards of 50,000 people could have lived in the caverns comfortably. One theory is that the present Indian tribes found in Arizona are descendants of the slaves of the people in, who inhabited the cave. Undoubtedly, a good many thousands of years, or thousands of years before the Christian era, a people lived here who reached a high stage of civilization. The, chronolo- the chronology of human history is full of gaps. Professor Jordan is much enthused uh, over the discoveries and believes that the find will prove of incalculable value in archaeological work. So let me get this shit straight. Very advanced civilization, capable of carving out the space for a giant city in the Rock of the Grand Canyon. Uh, a civilization reliant on agriculture. Why wouldn't they build their uh, civilization, I don't know, maybe fucking closer to the fields where, the, where people actually grow shit? Why would you build it way in the bottom of a canyon in a cave? Like, why build it in a place that is the biggest pain in the ass to get to? A place where you, you don't have room to farm. You, there's no livestock to, to graze down there. A place where if you hunt for food, you have to fucking drag your kills down to the bottom of the goddamn Grand Canyon. Uh, seems a tad bit poorly planned. Uh, that, that, to me, is the main problem with the uh, folklore concerning underground cities. How are you going to eat? Right? Uh, what are these people eating? Like, what, are they just storing all the meat? Or, like, I, these cave cities don't make sense to me. Why, are these people just living on fucking mushrooms and worms? I don't think you, I don't think you can do that, by the way. I don't think you, you probably should do that. You probably shouldn't live on mushrooms and worms. Probably also not good to live in a cave while you're eating that. Not getting a lot of vitamin D. You would, you would look like shit if you lived in a cave and ate mushrooms and worms. Just, dude, your skin, man, it is, it is falling off in fucking patches, dude. What have you been living on? Mushrooms and worms? Yes, that's exactly correct. B- uh, please excuse me while I pass out from malnutrition. Uh, one thing. Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, I forgot this article goes on a little bit more. I thought we were done. He says, one thing I've not spoken of, which may be of interest. There is one chamber of the passageway which is not ventilated. And when we approached, a deadly, snaky smell struck us. Our light would not penetrate the gloom. Uh, until stronger ones are available, we will not know what the chamber contains. Some say snakes, but others boo-hoo this idea. Oh, they boo-hoo this idea. And think it may contain a deadly gas or chemicals used by the ancients. No sounds are heard, but it smells snaky, just the same. The whole underground insulation gives one of shaky nerves the creeps. The gloom is like a weight on one's shoulders, and our flashlights and candles only make the darkness blacker. Imagination can re- revel in conjectures and ungodly daydreams back to the ages that will have elapsed till the mind reels dizzily in space. What are you writing, fucking poetry? Smelling snaky. How perfect. Yeah, this whole story smells pretty snaky. The next section is an Indian legend. In connection with this story, it is notable that among the Hopi Indians, the tradition is told that their ancestors once lived in an underworld in the Grand Canyon. Tell dissension arose between the good and the bad. The people of one heart and the people of two hearts. Machetto, who was their chief counseled them to leave the underworld, but there was no way out. The chief then caused a tree to grow up and pierced the roof of the underworld, and the, and the people of one heart climbed out. They tarried by the Red River, which is the Colorado, and grew grain and corn. They sent out a message to the Temple of the Sun, asking the blessing of peace, goodwill, and rain for the people of one heart. That messenger never returned, but today at the Hopi villages at sundown can be seen the old men of the tribe out on their housetops, gazing towards the sun, looking for the messenger. When he returns, their lands and ancient dwelling place will be restored to them. That is the tradition. Among the engravings of animals, in the cave was seen the image of a heart over the spot where it is located. The legend was learned by W.E. Rollins, the artist during a year spent with Hopi Indians. Oh man, fucking it's all coming together, man. Egyptians, Indians, uh, it's all part of the same ancient advanced culture. I get why he kept saying Orient now, man. You know, it makes sense. This, this, now this story, as you, as you can imagine, caused a huge sensation when it was published. And, and as you can imagine, it was almost immediately discredited. The Smithsonian has no record of either of these scientists, nor their discoveries, and firmly quells any claim that Egyptian artifacts have been found anywhere in North or South America. Also, no one was able to find the giant caves that were written about. Uh, no evidence of a civilization described in this area. And outside of the story, there is no proof of anyone named G.E. Kincaid. There's no Idaho-born explorer named Nett. There is no Professor S.A. Jordan. The Smithsonian has no record of someone of either name ever doing fucking anything for them. 
Considering the lack of evidence and the pure off-the-wall sensation of the report, it seems like there's a very good chance that this was just a hoax perpetrated by the newspaper to sell more copies of the paper, which did happen from time to time with old papers. They would just write insane stories to sell papers. Uh, despite this being an obvious hoax, there are a lot of people who still believe this tale today. Th this story has woven itself into the fabric of wackadoodles. Other fringy authors and explorers have claimed to find the same cave. Uh, conspiracy theorist John Rhodes, he claims to know the secret to the ca cave, although, of course, he won't say where it is. He says it's constantly guarded by armed security, as that it has become the base of operations for a shadowy, secret Illuminati-type society. Of course it has. And my favorite wackadoodle, David Icke, the man behind the, li the lizard Ill Illuminati conspiracy, uh, the man behind the conspiracy about alien lizards ruling the earth, he believes in this city. Uh, Ike believes that the Kincaid cave system not only exists, but is one of the reptilians' most important underground cities, right up there with the Denver airport. In his 1999 masterpiece, The Biggest Secret, a copy rests here in the Suck Dungeon, Ike writes, In 1909, a subterranean city which was built with the precision of the Great Pyramid was found by G.E. Kincaid near the Grand Canyon in Arizona. It was big enough to accommodate 50,000 people, and the mummified bodies found were of Oriental or possibly Egyptian origin, according to the expo uh, expedition leader, Professor S.A. Jordan. My own research suggests that it is from another dimension, the lower fourth dimension, where the reptilian control and manipulation is primarily orchestrated. Right? Another well-researched fact spread to the masses by truth seeker, by truth spreader, David Icke. Uh, now let's see what the masses think about this lost city in today's Idiots of the Internet. Idiots of the Internet. Okay, for today, I found a video titled G.E. Kincaid, uh, Egyptian Artifacts in the Grand Canyon. It's published on July 5th, 2017 by Ancient Mystery. Uh, the video's description is pretty sweet. It says, The Egyptian's Grand Canyon, the Egyptian artifacts, and the real history of the mighty, unforgiving Grand Canyon. I'll start by bringing this to your attention. Prime Minister Nubar Pasha of Egypt was first Prime Minister of Egypt, uh, was the first, I suppose to say, and served his first term from January 1884 to June 1888. He contacted the U.S. Department of State and requested that all of the Egyptian artifacts found in the Grand Canyon to be returned to Egypt. He also requested that no more information about Egyptians ever being in the Grand Canyon be published by the Smithsonian Institution. So it seems the Smithsonian has also been silenced at around the same time giant discoveries were increasing. G.E. Kincaid served in the Marine Corps. After retiring, he worked for S.A. Jordan as an archaeologist. Jordan was sent to the Grand Canyon by the Smithsonian Institute to investigate the information that was reported by John Wesley Powell. The tunnel is presently on Cliff Wall, 395 feet above the present flow of the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon. Archaeologists estimate that, man, that the man-made cavern is around 3,000 years old, Watch video for more information on the Egyptians in the Grand Canyon found by G.E. Kincaid in Mythology Explored by Ancient Mystery on YouTube. Okay, the only true parts of that description is that there really was an explorer named John Wesley Powell uh, who did explore the Grand Canyon in 1869, but he did not find Egyptian anything, fucking nothing. Also, Nubar Pasha was the first prime minister of Egypt, uh, but he never demanded that the Smithsonian return ancient uh, Egyptian artifacts found in the Grand Canyon to Egypt. Because that never happened. And he, of, and he, of course, never demanded the Smithsonian uh, to be silent. And even if he did, who gives a fuck what Egypt thinks? Like, that's such a ridiculous thing. Like, I mean, no offense if, if we have, like, Egyptian listeners, but Egypt has never been even close to a military threat to the United States. Like, Egypt could ask us or demand whatever it wants. We would never listen. Right? Egypt would be like, hey, it's Smithsonian. I don't want you talking about Egypt. We'd be like, we don't fucking give a shit what you want. Uh, we'll take over your country if you don't let us do more archaeology digs, all right? What do you have, like 17 people in your army? Um, so so this is this is all nonsense. Uh, this is a made-up fairy tale repeated over and over again on janky-ass websites to try to sell you shit like monoatomic gold and ormus. Uh, okay, so here's the comments. Lou Hernandez posts, Another amazing video. Thank you. After the report in the Phoenix newspaper in the early 1900s, the Smithsonian covered up the discovery. What a crime. This would completely change our history and raise many more questions, particularly with the Aztecs and Mayans. The Egyptians really were technologically advanced. How were they able to cut these underground cities so smoothly? 
Well, I'll tell you how they were able to do it, uh, Lou. Uh, they didn't do it. That's how. Uh, they never did it. So you, it's, it, you're able to do a lot of things when you don't actually have to do anything. You can, when, you, when you just get to make up whatever, uh, you know, facts supposedly happened. Also, why in God's name would the Smithsonian want to cover this up? Why would they want to cover up the single greatest, greatest archaeological discovery in all of North America, if not the entire world? That makes zero sense. Like, why would a museum that makes money charging people to see cool shit hide the coolest shit they have ever found, especially when they found it in their own country, on land that the government owns? It's, it'd like, be the easiest fucking discovery, be the best thing that ever happened to the Smithsonian. That's, that's like saying an oil company has covered up the discovery of a massive amount of previously undiscovered oil discovered on land that the oil company already owns and has the right to mine. Like, there's no motive. This is what kills me about so many conspiracy theorists. They have no fucking clue uh, how to understand motive. Like, like when there is zero motive for the conspiracy, there is no conspiracy. Like I have to say that over and over again. There's no fucking conspiracy when there's no motive. Um, Nathaniel Barron posts a little time suck reference, uh, even though I'm strongly guessing he's not a time sucker. He says, great info. There are those that theorize that the whole canyon was man-made. The rock formations look a lot like those found in the area of Sodom and Gomorrah along Nimrod's castle or along with Nimrod's castle. Also, just to name a few. So I'm inclined. Oh, their grammar is so terrible. It's actually hard to understand what they're fucking trying to say sometimes. Justin. Okay, okay. Anyway, he says, I'm inclined to agree with him. Uh, I had no idea that Nimrod was building uh, amazing cities. Hail, hail Nimrod. Now I buy it. Nimrod built a city in the bottom of the Grand Canyon for the cult of the curious to live in when Armageddon hits. It makes sense. That's when we go full cult. That's when we start having so much sex with each other and we wait for the end of the world. Because uh, I, I do think you have to do that at some point if you're a cult, right? I think you have to go to a compound and you have to fuck each other a whole bunch and wait for the uh, end of the world. I'm pretty sure that's in one of the uh, first five rules of how to start a cult, which is a, a book I'm sure someone has probably written somewhere. Uh, there actually are those who theorize that the, that the canyon was man-made. Um, they're called maniacs uh, and wackadoodles. Uh, Den Bo posts, never heard of this before. Yeah, of course you haven't. It's nonsense. Uh, that's the reason you haven't heard of it. Uh, it's gobbledygook. Uh, user Tanman1107 posts some gibberish that prompts ancient mystery, uh, the channel to respond uh, with a comment proving he or she is even more insane than I initially thought. Tanman posts, do you believe the earth is flat? Have you heard the theory of mountains being gigantic trees that were cut down, like Devil's Tower, for instance? For, for fuck's sake. Uh, apparently there are people who believe that the earth is flat and that mountains are just uh, giant tree stumps. And then Ancient Mysteries responds with, I don't trust NASA. If they say we live on a globe, I don't believe them. Credibility, LOL. <laughs> Credibility, NASA. Uh, the rocks do appear to be stumps. This is a real belief. There is actually a belief amongst some flat earthers that what we call forests are just tiny remnants of, ancient, uh, of an ancient and vibrant world, one that featured trees with trunks as big as mountains. Uh, trees that reach the heavens. Some people believe that the things we call forests are in reality just low-lying bushes, the impoverished remains of an ecologically rich world that held 40-mile high trees with trunks two miles across. And, and how do we know this happened? Uh, that they, le they left their, their tree, trumps, uh, tree stumps excuse me, behind. Flat-top mountains are actually remnants of just giant trees cut down by large machines. Right, those those same machines dug all the canyons, like the Great Canyons, like like the Grand Canyon, like river valleys. They're just old quarry mines. Uh, their cliffs have been, you know, carved by machines. Volcanoes are actually just uh, heaps of industrial waste left behind uh, from big big machines that ravage the earth. Uh, toxic chemicals inside them react, you know, generating heat and fire. You know, that's what makes explosions. Why do certain people think this? Because it's how the world looks to them. Seriously. The earth appears flat, so therefore, it must be flat. They stand on a beach, they look out the ocean, oh, it's flat, world must be flat. These same people will look at Devil's Tower in Wyoming and be like, that looks like a giant tree stump. So therefore, must be giant tree stump. You know, it's just that, that logic of if something looks like something, it must be that thing. It's fucking idiotic. These people have no understanding of math, no understanding of geology, just a, I believe what I see. That looks like something, so it must be that thing. Uh, Robert Shrewsbury is apparently also an explorer, and he too has found evidence of ancient Egyptian life beneath the Arizona desert. Of course, yes. He posts, from my work, I found several Egyptian tunnels like Kincaid's Cave. However, they would need to be handled with care. My machinery can detect a void or tunnel 
up to several hundred feet deep. These tunnels are about 2,000 feet long and close to the Little Colorado connecting the larger Grand Canyon. I also get good readings on metals down deep with my machinery. You gotta, you gotta love a post that starts off with, from my work. Immediately you know you're listening to a maniac. From my work, I too have concluded that not all aliens do mean us harm. <laughs> from my work, I have determined that the city of Atlantis is in fact still inhabited by people. From my work, I hypothesize that my mother will begin to start letting me stay out past 10 p.m. on the weekends. Once I turn 35, she'll let me use my machinery. <laughs> uh, this guy didn't have any replies under this fantastic comment, so I thought about adding one. I actually typed out, From my work, I was able to determine that you have no idea what you're fucking talking about. And the only tunnel you've ever found uh, was discovered the day you were born, and that's your mother's vagina. But I didn't post it because it felt cruel. I felt like I was being a bully. Uh, I felt like I was writing something that wasn't going to convince Robert Shrewsbury or probably anybody else to no longer be an idiot of the internet. Idiots of the internet. 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 Okay, so now for one final quick Grand Canyon legend before we move on to another park. Uh, one of the tribes that inhabited the canyon long before European settlers showed up was the Hopi. And the Hopi believed in the god Massa, the supposed keeper of death. And if you see strange lights coming towards you from within the canyon at night, or you hear a faint tapping of rocks, Massa is coming for you. Uh, many canyon explorers have allegedly experienced nausea and anxiety shortly after hearing these rocks clanking. Uh, a large number of accidents have allegedly occurred following the sound of Massa. Uh, excuse me. So maybe Massa is tossing people off cliffs here and there. Maybe he built the uh, hidden Egyptian city. Maybe he's fucking tired of people driving cars into his canyon and littering it up. Who knows? Time now for our next park and our next set of mysteries. Yosemite National Park. While Yellowstone became America's first national park in 1872, Yosemite National Park is actually the first wilderness site that the U.S. government decided to protect in 1864 when a conservationist convinced Abraham motherfucking Lincoln to declare Yosemite Valley and the uh, Mariposa Grove of Giant Sequoias, a public trust of California. This marked the first time that the U.S. government protected land for public enjoyment, and it laid the foundation for the establishment of the national and state park systems. On October 1st, 1890, Congress set aside over 1,500 square miles, about the size of Rhode Island, uh, for America's third uh, national park, Yosemite, located in the Sierra Nevada mountain range, just over 150 miles due east of San Francisco. Home of El Capitan, a giant granite cliff that stands tall above the Yosemite Valley, uh, one of the most popular rock climbing destinations in the world. There are ancient uh, groves of sequoias and so many waterfalls, but who gives a shit about nature today? We're here to get weird, right? We're, let's, let's talk about who's visiting the park. Let's talk about visitors who don't pay park entrance dues because they're not from this planet and they feel like they're above the law. Let's talk about some cheap ass UFOs. On the evening of September 19th, 2002, a strange disc appeared in the sky over Yosemite National Park. A number of people captured the supposedly alien craft on video. It is now recognized as one of uh, some of the best UFO footage uh, ever taken. Moments after the strange object was seen in the sky, Air Force jets arrived and circled the area, but the pilots were unable to find anything. What did those people see in 2002? Uh, and this incident is just uh, one of many alleged UFO encounters that have occurred in Yosemite National Park with numerous vi visitors claiming to have seen strange lights in the sky. Now, some have dismissed the sightings as meteors or just optical illusions, but what is the truth? Now, I've watched this video. To me, it looks like it's some sort of rocket. To me, it looks like something probably from this world, but that's just me. And, and I'm just looking at one of many sightings. Who knows? I mean, Fresno, California, less than 60 miles from the park, uh, there have been so many sightings of, of similar-looking, pale, long-legged, bipedal entities between Fresno and Yosemite that people have actually started calling these creatures Fresno Nightcrawlers. And they don't scare me one bit. I'm not even fucking scared, you guys, because it's a light outside right now, and I'm not alone, and I'm a long way from Fresno. I would feel very differently if I was camping out in the dark uh, Yosemite and saw some weird lights. Uh, in addition to aliens, Yosemite may also be cursed have we ever talked about a curse on the suck before? Yes, the Mothman suck. Uh, in that suck, we referenced a curse on the land around Point Pleasant, West Virginia, where Chief Cornstalk was murdered in 1777 by some dirty dealing commander of Fort Randolph for crimes he never committed. And it was believed uh, by some that the land was put under a curse for 100 years. And now we have another curse that has to do with American Indians 
being dealt a dirty hand by some white settlers. Come on, white settlers. Stop doing curse-worthy shit. When white settlers first arrived in Yosemite Valley, they encountered a tribe of uh, American Indians called the uh, Awani, who were a peaceful people but also prone to occasionally poach a little bit of livestock from their new neighbors. Uh, in the 1850s, the new settlers decided they'd had enough of sharing the land with the locals who kept taking their shit, which I do understand, but also kind of hypocritical, right? Just a little bit of an attitude of, hey, we didn't come over here and steal your land just to have you steal the shit that we put on the land we stole from you. Where's your integrity? And I know, I know, I know, I know. It's more complicated than that. The settlers weren't stealing land. They were legally settling land that their government had taken. But if you're a member of the Iwani, uh, from their perspective, these motherfuckers just stole your land. And now they won't even share their livestock with you. Not cool. Uh, the settlers sought to relocate the Iwani to a reservation near Fresno. The normally peaceful Iwani, led by Chief uh, uh, Tanaya, did not feel like moving. Understandable. First, some new folks show up on your land without asking, and now they think the land is theirs, and now they want you off that land. The Iwani refused to leave, so the settlers call for the army. A contingent of armed men led by Captain John Bowling show up to forcibly remove the tribe, and things go anything but smoothly. Instead of fleeing in fear when the troops show up, the Iwani fight back. During the ensuing gunfight, Chief uh, Tanaya's son is killed, and he invokes a curse on the valley and a curse against the white men. Legend has it. The chief blared out this curse as he was confronted by an armed captain during the battle. He supposedly said, kill me, captain. Yes, kill me as you killed my son, as you would kill my people if they were to come to you. You would kill all my race if you had the power. You have made me sorrowful, my life dark. You killed the child of my heart. Why not kill the father? You may kill me, sir captain, but you shall not live in peace. I will follow in your footsteps. I will not leave my home, but be with the spirits among the rocks, the waterfalls, in the rivers, and in the wind. Wherever you go, I will be with you. You will not see me, but you will fear the spirit of the old chief and grow cold. That's some fucking intense shit. That's a, that's a good curse if I've ever heard one. Uh, since that fateful day, Tanaya Canyon, and by some accounts, the whole Yosemite Valley has been plagued by all sorts of freak accidents, strange deaths, mishaps, Unexplained phenomena such as unexplained noises, such as shadowy apparitions, fucking shadow people. Of course they're part of that curse. They're the scariest things in existence. Uh, there are supposedly far more incidents of rock climbing and hiking accidents and fatalities in Tanaya uh, in that area than other places in the park. So many people have gone missing uh, that, that the area has earned itself the ominous nickname of the Bermuda Triangle of Yosemite. Even the legendary naturalist and extremely experienced mountaineer John Muir was not immune to the supposed curse. He had a near-fatal accident while exploring the canyon in 1873. Uh, he wrote about it later in 1918 in his book, Steep Trails, writing, I was ascending a precipitous rock front, smoothed by glacial action, when I suddenly fell, for the first time since I touched foot to Sierra Rocks. After several somersaults, I became insensible from the shock, and when consciousness returned, I found myself wedged among short, stiff bushes. I cannot remember what made me fall or where I had fallen from but I saw that if I had rolled a little further, my mountain climbing would have been finished. For just beyond the bushes, the canyon wall steepened, and I might have fallen to the bottom. Uh, also, the official park trail guide map marks a hike through the cursed land in stark red with a disclaimer that says, hiking in Tanaya Canyon is a dangerous, or excuse me, is dangerous and is strongly discouraged. All right, now let's talk about some uh, hauntings. We've talked about UFOs, talked about cursed land. What else has happened in Yosemite? Uh, ghosts. The majestic Yosemite Hotel, uh, formerly known as the Iwani Hotel, named after the previously mentioned Doom Tribe, is supposedly full of all kinds of spirits and spooky, creepy shit. Uh, opened in 1927, the Iwani Hotel immediately became one of America's premier vacation destinations. It was a large, luxurious hotel built in an area known for mostly camping and small lodges. Its elegant yet rustic organic feel and the majestic grandeur of its scenic surroundings quickly made it a very popular spot and now it's popular with ghost hunters. One spirit said to inhabit the hotel is the ghost of Mary Curry Tresseter. Mary was part of the hotel's design. Uh, she was part of the hotel's opening. She lived in the hotel for most of her life, died in her private apartment inside the hotel in 1970, and her spirit supposedly lingers on the sixth floor where her room was located. Sightings of her ghost are frequently reported by both staff and guests. Mary has been reported to tuck in visitors as they sleep, fold their clothes, misplace items around rooms, and even occasionally call out to guests. Sounds like a pretty friendly ghost, really. Uh, how weird would it be to get tucked in by a ghost? 
Like, like I think I'd be super scared at first to see the covers move, uh, maybe even paralyzed with fear, but then maybe less scared if the ghost gently tucked me in. Now, and gently being the key word. An aggressive tuck in, that doesn't make me feel safe. It makes me feel like you're trying to choke me out, maybe suffocate me. No one likes an aggressive tuck. But a gentle tuck and then folding on my clothes, that's a nice touch to a hotel stay. That's not a bad haunting. That's a sweet haunting. I like sweet ghosts. And what if the ghost happened to look like Lucifina? Like sexy ass Lucifina. Oh man, all tatted up, sexy fishnets, black leather boots, maybe a maybe a black leather corset, maybe some kind of garter belt situation, uh, some kind of black see through top, maybe you know long thick kind of wavy black hair uh, pulled into a, a ponytail of some kind, uh, maybe the hair shaved down on, uh, to the skin on one side of the head. Now we're talking about a good haunting. That's that's the kind of haunting I'm into. You know, I, I don't I don't even mind an aggressive tucking in that situation. I don't I don't mind an aggressive untucking. I don't mind a, a ripping off of the boxer briefs by the ghost. Maybe some other ghost stuff. Maybe some spectral sex. Maybe a little bit of warm ghost vagina. Doing some stuff, you know? Maybe that's okay. Maybe I should stop turning this episode into some creepy ghost porn. Maybe get back into national parks. Maybe I've just made this real weird for people listening with their kids, you know? I just want to say ghost sex. If I'm going to be haunted, that's what I want. Now, now I'm done. Another spirit said to inhabit the Iwani Hotel is connected to a rocking chair kept in the room that former suck subject and U.S. President John F. Kennedy, the F is for fuck, John fuck Kennedy. Uh, he stayed in during, <laughs> that would be so great if that was true. What's his middle name? It's fuck, actually. It's John fuck Kennedy. Um, it's John fuck fighter kill Kennedy is his name. What? Uh, he, stayed, he stayed there during a visit in 1962, a year before he'd become infamously assassinated. At the, uh, at the time, the chair had been put in the room at the president's request because he had back pain. If you remember from that suck, his back was a hurting a lot. He reportedly spent a long time in the chair, calmly rocking away. Uh, the chair was removed from the room when he left, but oddly, since his death, a spectral rocking chair has often been reported moving on its own in rooms and halls throughout the hotel's third floor, which is where his room was. Uh, and especially these have been reported in the actual room itself. And the chair always seems to rock back and to the left. Back and to the left. Uh, could not help myself again, sorry. Ghost rocking chair. That's not too scary to me if, it, if it's rocking gently. And again, gently being key here. If it's an aggressive, just like rocking back and forth, like super unnaturally fast, fuck that. I grab my bags. I thank the other ghost for folding up my clothes. I thank the sex ghost for the sex and I go home. Uh, while the rocking chair and the ghost of Mary Curie uh, Tresseter are the most often cited spirits, they're not the only ones. Strange noises, disembodied footsteps, other apparitions have been witnessed. Uh, they actually helped inspire the look into, or excuse me, um, the, the look of this hotel actually uh, helped inspire the Overlook Hotel from Stanley Kubrick's classic horror uh, film, The Shining. So this is like a known creepy hotel. Uh, and the Yosemite Awani Hotel isn't the only haunted hotel in Yosemite National Park. The Sierra Sky Ranch Hotel is also uh, allegedly haunted and has even scarier guests. Originally built in 1877, the Sierra Sky Ranch started its life as a sanitarium for housing and quarantine victims of tuberculosis. Already getting creepy. Uh, victims uh, who lived mostly in squalor, people forgotten by society. Many of them died there. Uh, many of them were kids who died there. In later years, the premises uh, became uh, a home for veterans of World War I. And then it went on to become a modest 29-room hotel. And that's what it is today. Where guests constantly report a strange... Uh, excuse me, strange sightings and, and other uh, paranormal activity. One of the most common types of ghostly occurrence at the Sierra Sky Ranch is that of phantom children. No thank you. Uh, spooky ghost kids said to run up and down the stairs, run up and down the halls. Uh, they can be heard doing their little creepy giggles, doing weird whispers, talking when no one's around, uh, whispers and giggles coming from the walls themselves. Fuck no. No thank you. Uh, gentle or not, I don't know why, uh, like ghost kids scare me the most. I would rather, if I had to pick between like a large, scary ghost monster thingy or a little whispery, giggly ghost kid thingy, I'm going to actually pick the monster. Um, the ghost kids, man, creep me out. These spectral children are reportedly most often cited in the media room in the main living room of, uh, of the hotel. Blame for some of the uh, poltergeist activity reported uh, such as lights, faucets, and appliances turning on and off, doors opening or slamming shut, guest clothes being tugged? What? Guest clothes being tugged by unseen hands. Oh my, that's when I die. That's when I fall over dead of uh, a heart attack. 
Other ghosts said to inhabit the Sierra Sky Ranch are a woman who supposedly lurks about the main house and library who smells of perfume. Okay, I like that. Uh, there's a ghostly bar patron who kisses bar visitors and bartenders on the cheek. All right, okay, that's okay. And then there's uh, the more sinister entity of a scowling, angry-looking man who paces around the hotel veranda and violently knocks over furniture. No, uh-uh. You, sir, can take the ghost kids and you can go in the woods and violently knock around some brush where no one has to fucking hear you. There are so many tales of hauntings and spirits in Yosemite National Park. I could do an entire time suck on just these tales. A couple. We're not going to get to all of them today, but here's the last one. Yosemite's most famous waterfall, uh, Bridal Veil Fall, cascades 617 feet down a sheer granite cliff, also may be haunted. The Awani tribe we've spoken of believe that the, that the falls are haunted by an evil spirit called Bohono. Bohono known to try and lure unsuspecting victims over the edge to their deaths. Uh, sometimes Bohono uses hypnotic rainbows in the mist to draw people closer. And in other cases, the spirit cries out to lure the curious to step one step uh, too far out into the water. Sometimes Bohono even appears as an apparition to beckon people close enough to the edge for a strong gust of wind to fling them over the falls. And there have actually been a few recorded deaths over the years of people falling, uh, slipping over the fall, being smashed into the rocks far below, the wind super unpredictable at the top of the falls. Campers in the area have also reported hearing strange voices or sounds coming from the direction of the falls at night. And I actually found an audio recording, uh, supposedly of this, of this entity, uh, recorded last summer on June 11th, 2018. Let me play it for you now. Hi, campers. Come check out this cool waterfall. Party another drink, Charles, and don't be stingy this time. Fill up the goddamn glass, you bastard. No spirits over here, campers. Huh? Old Pohono isn't pushing anybody off the ledge. No, sir, he just wants to hold your hand. While you lean over and just feel the refreshing, pristine water. Stop moving your hands so much, Charles. You trying to... You trying to help me talk or you trying to turn me on? Whee! Is that what you wanted to hear, Charles, you pervert? Whee! Ah, uh, so there's that recording. Huh. Uh, waterfall spirit sounded, sounded a lot like a drunk Woody fighting with Charles Gutman. So, you know, make it that what you wish. Uh, Yosemite's also had its share of disappearances over the years. Uh, are the Fresno nightcrawlers taking people? Is it the curse of the Iwani? Is it ghosts? Maybe the most mysterious vanishing to have ever occurred at the Yosemite National Park is the disappearance of 14-year-old Stacy Ann Harris in 1981. These stories always weird me out. On the afternoon of July 17th, 1981, Harris was on a camping trip with her father and six others at the Sunrise Sierra Camp, small cluster of cabins for people passing through on hikes along the popular Mountain Chalet Loop. Harris expressed interest in taking some photos of a nearby lake, and since it was close by, her dad said she was fine to go alone. Another member of the group, a 72-year-old man named Gerald Stewart did decide to go with her. As the two approached the lake, the older man reportedly sat down to take a rest, take a little break as Eris went on ahead. In the meantime, other members of the group were able to look down and see the whole thing from a ridge, and they watched as Eris disappeared into some trees. When she didn't come back out of the trees within a reasonable length of time, the group goes and looks for her, can only find the lens of her camera. No other trace of the girl whatsoever. An extensive official search of the area using helicopters and tracker dogs would have no luck finding her either, even though they saw exactly where she disappeared. Eventually, the search is called off because no one could find any evidence at all regarding what happened to her. Park Superintendent Robert Benoise would say at the time, she just seems to have disappeared. Since she was wearing braces on her teeth, her skeleton would be somewhat easy to identify, but no sign of her has ever been found. What happened to her? Nobody knows. Some think she was abducted by aliens. Uh, some think um, many people have been abducted by aliens in uh, Yosemite. The National Park Service, they don't know because they, they actually uh, also, they don't keep track of missing persons in the park. The National Park Service doesn't know how many individuals have disappeared in its park over the years or its parks. So that makes me think about the Grand Canyon disappearances earlier. Who knows how many people are disappearing in the parks? Uh, David uh, Polides or P Polides, fucking something. David, what, David doesn't matter? Uh, a famous author on mysterious vanishings who has written numerous books on the matter, in particular uh, on those which have occurred within U.S. national parks, thinks the parks try to cover up the disappearances. He claims that during his investigation of the Eris Case Park, 
Uh, officials were evasive and reticent to release any info on it when faced with a request under the Freedom of Information Act, even going as far as to allegedly deliberately withhold and flat out hide facts relating to it. Uh, he repeatedly accused National Park officials as being corrupt and suspiciously secretive on such mysterious disappearances. Is there something sinister going on? Uh, more recently, strange disappearances include the 2005 vanishing of 51-year-old Michael Allen Fissery, who was an avid, experienced hiker and backpacker. On June 15, 2005, uh, Michael headed out to uh, uh, on a hike along the northern end of the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, but at some point changed his mind, went up the Pacific Crest Trail. That'd be the last time anyone saw him. When he did not return after his wilderness permit expired, a search was carried out, but all that could be found was a backpack containing a topographical map, a camera, and a bottle of water. Massive search involving personnel from five counties utilizing aircraft and tracker dogs were unable to find any trace of the missing hiker, and his case remains utterly unsolved. In June of 2011, there was the case of 30-year-old George Penka, who was out hiking at the Upper Yosemite Falls with his church group. During the hike, he fell behind the group, proceeded to completely vanish off the face of the earth. Despite extensive searches, no sign of him was ever found. Uh, and then strangely with him, Yosemite National Park officials took down uh, his missing persons page just a, a few weeks after he vanished. Damn you Fresno nightcrawlers, damn you to hell. So you meet sacks ready to book those, uh, those camping spots yet? A lot of weird shit going on. Uh, let's pick a different park now. Let's head east, way east. Let's go cryptozoological. Let's go all the way to Puerto Rico and talk about the legend of the Chupacabra right after today's sponsor. Uh, Time Suck is brought to you today by Hims. Uh, I've been loving their Morning Glow Vitamin C Serum and their Good Night Wrinkle Cream. And, and, I, and I think, uh, you know, I'm going to add their anti-aging prescription cream uh, to my repertoire here soon. Uh, sounds weird, but I like the way their stuff smells. Uh, I like having a nice citrusy start to my day in the morning. Makes me feel tropical. Makes me feel sunny. And then I like the, the chocolatey coffee type smell of the Good Night Wrinkle Cream at night. And I, I love mochas. So I love that smell. Makes me feel fancy but it's not expensive. And that's my favorite kind of fancy. I like, I prefer cheap fancy. And if my ween ever loses its lean, for hims can help me there too. Uh, they put some stiff pride back into some soft shamecocks. Sexual performance issues, pretty common, but thanks to science, erectile dysfunction, it's optional with 4 Hims connects you with real doctors and medical grade solutions to treat erectile dysfunction. They provide well-known generic equivalents to name brand uh, prescriptions. They're not selling gas station counter supplements. So try Hims for a month today. Get started for just five bucks. Five bucks while supplies last. See website for full details. This will cost you hundreds if you went to the doctor or a pharmacy. Go to 4 slash timesuckED. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash time suck E-D. For hymns.com slash time suck E-D. Link in the episode description. Now time for El Yunque. All right, so we now visit El Yunque National Forest. 28,000 acres of rainforest was initially set aside in 1876 by King Alfonso XII of Spain, and it's one of the oldest nature preserves in the Western Hemisphere, and it became a national forest in 1906. Uh, located a 20-minute drive east of San Juan, the rainforest is the largest block of public land on the island of Puerto Rico, and also Puerto Rico's most visited natural attraction. There are over 240 species of plants and trees in El Yunque, uh, Taino petroglyphs, there still may be some uh, rare parrots. None have been seen, actually, sadly, since the, uh, not alive anyway, since the recent hurricanes, Irma and Maria. Uh, lots of frogs, lots of hiking trails, and possibly some chupacabras. Uh, what is a chupacabra? Uh, the great Nimrod, he's part chupacabra. Nimrod, our time side god, if you'll remember, is a giant space sasquatch the size of an entire galaxy with the head of a chupacabra who rides a black unicorn with flaming suns for eyes. Hail Nimrod! But a regular old chupacabra is a little blood-drinking monster that especially likes the blood of goats. Uh, physical descriptions vary. Some report it to be a heavy creature the size of a small bear with a row of spines reaching from the neck to the base of the tail. Some describe it to be a reptile-like creature said to have uh, leathery or scaly greenish-gray skin and sharp spines or quills running down its back. Often reported to be three to four feet tall and, and stands and hops in a fashion similar to that of a kangaroo. Uh, still others describe it as looking like some strange breed of wild dog. 
generally described as being mostly hairless with a pronounced spinal ridge, uh, unusually pronounced eye sockets, fangs, and claws, and is reported to drain all of his victim's blood and sometimes organs through three holes in the shape of a downwards pointing triangle. Uh, still others describe it as a shifty-eyed guy named Todd who works the cash register at the 7-Eleven on Friday and Saturday nights and never asks ID for cigs or beer and always wears his shirts a bit too unbuttoned and too tight and smells like cabbage. And of course, that last description is not true. This is, uh, this is, that's not a chupacabra. That's a, that's a creepy Todd, which is a different creature. Uh, the chupacabra is a strange, strange beast. It may come from uh, El Yunque. Tales of chupacabra first emerged in Puerto Rico in the late 1990s. Actually, specifically 1995. Uh, this beast was thought to be responsible for killing and draining the blood of livestock, which earned its nickname chupacabra, Spanish for goat sucker. And the first person to ever see this monster, we know the first sighting, is Madeline Tolentino a woman from Canovanas, a small town east of, Puerto Rico, uh, east of San Juan in Puerto Rico. Uh, in 1995, she claims to have spotted uh, a scary alien-like creature out of her window. And uh, this, this uh, little town she lives is only about two miles from El Yunque. And the legend quickly became that the beast came from the park. Her story traveled fast. Many reported sightings soon followed. Soon reports of livestock were uh, found drained of blood accompanying the sightings. The legend quickly spread around the island, then the rest of Latin America, into the southern U.S., and then it blew up online, spread by UFO enthusiasts and conspiracy theorists to the rest of the world. Then in the early 2000s, a different chubacabra arrived on the scene. The folklore evolved. Uh, this one shared some of the traits of the earlier sightings, but was a little less alien in look. This time it was described as a hairless dog-like animal walking on four legs. And unlike most monsters, uh, this type is not based exclusively on sightings. Uh, chubacabra bodies were supposedly found. And then Benjamin Radford, a research fellow, with a committee for skeptical inquiry, began to investigate the reports of these bodies. Uh, he would explain, when you have a body, everything changes. You have DNA samples, you have bone samples, you have morphology. And uh, as with all his missions, Radford approached the Chupacabra with an open mind, employing what he calls investigative skepticism, and he conducted field work, collected evidence, and interviewed witnesses. He says, uh, I was, of course, initially skeptical of the creature's existence. At the same time, I was mindful that new animals have yet to be discovered. I didn't want to debunk or dismiss it. If the chupacabra was real, I wanted to find it. And uh, the obvious place for him to start looking was these chupacabra bodies. They'd mostly turned up in Texas and other southwestern U.S. states. And Radford, uh, you know, investigated about a dozen hairless, gaunt creatures with burnt-looking skin. Uh, DNA tests that he took furthered the mystery. All of the DNA tests came back with the same result. Humanoid of unknown origin. Very unsettling results uh, that usually comes back on, on a corrupted sample. Less than 20 different sets of unidentified biological remains have ever produced the result of humanoid of unknown origin. Even more troubling, uh, a high level of radioactivity was detected on these remains. Uh, more radioactive uh, or radioactivity was detected on these remains than remains of creatures found near Chernobyl less than two years after the infamous meltdown. Also, microscopic inspection revealed an alarming amount of orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements. It appears that these creatures, whatever they were, were living on basically nothing but Ormus. Uh, even more disturbing, a lot of the corpses began to reanimate during examinations. Uh, most troubling, some of these creatures began to dance. Possibly even more troubling, uh, they did the Macarena, and they seemed to enjoy it. So a lot of fucking weird shit that I just made up. Um... No, the DNA test uh, came back and, and said that the, the bodies of these chupacabras were actually the bodies of coyotes or coyotes, depending on where you live, uh, dogs, raccoons, and in one case, an actual fish. So why in the hell were people recording, uh, reporting coyotes and raccoons as chupacabras? Well, I got two words. Mind control. Damn you, MK Ultra. No, I have two different words. Uh, sarcoptic mange. The reason these animals get identified as chupacabras is because they've lost their hair due to sarcoptic mange, explains Radford. Um, sarcoptic mange is caused by itch-inducing mites called sarcoptes scabi that burrow into the upper layer of the skin. It's a common thing. Uh, it can make ordinary creatures look like monsters. It can give a dog or a raccoon or a coyote a very sparsely haired, uh, nearly bald coat with red or hyper-pigmented uh, pigmented black thickened skin. And then you add self-inflicted wounds to the creature because they've been scratching their hairless body and you have a chupacabra. But what about the blood-drained victims of the chupacabra? The mange doesn't explain that. 
Well, apparently this is also easily explained. Uh, the animals the chupacabras have attacked are most likely the victims of ordinary predators. And it's not uncommon for various predators to bite an animal, uh, sometimes in the neck, have the prey then still get away, and then eventually this prey, the prey will die from internal hemorrhaging with no other injuries apart from the puncture marks. So why don't they appear to have any blood? Well, Radford explains, when an animal dies, the heart and blood pressure stop, the blood seeps to the lowest part of the body, and it coagulates and thickens. It's called lividity. Uh, and it gives the illusion that they've been drained of blood. Okay, so if all this stuff is so, is so explainable, why does the legend live on? Well, basically because people like to believe in weird shit. Uh, makes life exciting. The story of Chupacabra uh, may also be tied to a lack of trust in the American government felt by a lot of people in Puerto Rico. Uh, the chupacabra, you know, could be like just another example of American exploitation and meddling, possibly the result of uh, top secret U.S. scientific experiments taking place in the El Yunque rainforest. This is actually the most common explanation for, uh, for where this beast comes from. Uh, Radford classifies the creature as the first Internet monster as well, saying if the first sighting had been in 1985 instead of 95, a couple of people would have heard of it, but, but it wouldn't have gone viral and spread across the world. So let's dig into this initial sighting. What inspired uh, Tolentino to come up with her story in the first place? Uh, and I love this. Very possibly the 1995 movie Species. The movie Species, had, which I, I loved when it came out, uh, had just been released in Puerto Rico. And the first Chupacabra witness, yeah, this Tolentino, she watched it just before claiming to see Chupacabra. Well, this film revolves around top secret U.S. scientific experiments. And, and it was partly filmed in Puerto Rico. Right? Like experiments with like making weird creatures. Radford says it's all there. She sees the movie. Then later she sees something she mistakes for a monster. Species, man. It may have been panned by critics, but it was actually a box office smash. 113 million box office haul versus a $35 million budget. And it quite possibly gave the world Chupacabra, which is way cooler to me than any award it could win. It's like, oh, your film won an Oscar? All right, who gives a shit? Uh, this film made a fucking monster. This film scares people who haven't even seen it. So there you go. So that's what El Yunque has given us. Chupacabra, possibly inspired by the movie Species. Now onto our last part. Now I saved the best for last. Let's head back to uh, California. Let's head back west. Home of Mount Shasta and home of some super strange mysteries that we'll talk about after our final sponsor. Time Suck is brought to you today by a new cartoon debuting on the Cartoon Channel Saturday mornings this spring. Pootie and Juju's Camp Time Wonder Stories. Uh, join beloved comic characters Pootie and Juju as they run a cafeteria in a summer camp in Yellow Canyon Mount National Monument Park called Shirley's Lunchbox. Hear your favorite classic catchphrases. Too little, too little, Pootie. Zip it, Juju. And, and, here's some new phrases written just for the cartoon. Throw yourself in the canyon if you don't like it, Pootie. Don't go chasing waterfalls, Juju. And... Even better, meet the newest Pootie and Juju character, the duos, pet, mangy, blood-sucking, raccoonish creature thing, Choopy. No goats, no throats, Choopy. Keep draining campers and we'll have to close the lunchbox. So watch new episodes every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Lemurian Standard Time. The show is rated NR for not real. Now back to your regularly scheduled interlude. talk about Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta is a potentially active volcano that sits at the southern end of the Cascade Mountain Range that, uh, Cascades, actually, uh, that starts in British Columbia, Canada, cuts down to Washington, Oregon, into Northern California. At 14,179 feet, it's the second highest peak in the Cascades, just a few hundred feet shorter than Washington's Mount Rainier, clocking in at 14,411 feet. Uh, located roughly 60 miles north of Redding, California, Mount Shasta sits in the Shasta Trinity National Forest, a federally designated forest that is not technically part of the national park system, but the mountain itself is because in 1976, Mount Shasta was declared a national natural landmark. Uh, the landmark covers 7,918 acres and Mount Shasta is one of the world's largest and most impressive stratovolcanoes, a uh, conical volcano built up by many layers of hardened lava uh, tephra, pumice, and ash. Mount Shasta also contains five separate glaciers. And it's very pretty. And a lot of people like to hike and climb on it and yada, yada, yada. Let's get to some weird shit. Uh, Mount Shasta has long been an important natural, uh, national, excuse me, an important natural landmark in various kind of new agey, crunchy, crystally movements. 
Uh, people have believed and still do believe that the mountain is an active wormhole to another dimension. People believe it's a frequent uh, UFO hotbed of, uh, of activity, that UFOs live inside or around the mountain, that it's a great place to, to feel all kinds of positive natural energy, uh, get your chakras realigned, form a drum circle, uh, burn some sage, surround yourself with crystals, drink juice infused with positive intentions, not wear deodorant, lather yourself in patchouli, never shave your legs, listen uh, to fish bootlegs, not work very much, uh, smoke a ton of weed, all that kind of stuff. It's great for all that. But in the 1930s, one eccentric took his new aginess uh, a little bit farther than most and started a cult based on a trip to Mount Shasta, a cult that exists still today. Guy W. Ballard, a mining engineer, claimed that during a 1930 visit to Mount Shasta, when he was 52 years old, he was contacted by a being known as St. Germain, one of the ascended masters of the Great White Brotherhood. Now, what the fuck is the Great White Brotherhood, you may think? It's a, it's a good question. Surprisingly, it's actually not some type of white power movement. It's uh, even weirder than that. The White Brotherhood are perfected beings of great power who spread spiritual teachings through selected humans. That's what some people believe. Most people think they don't exist. Who first alerted humanity to their existence? One Helena Petrov uh, Petrovna Blavatsky, a.k.a. Madame Blavatsky, one of the founders of the Theosophical Society. Now, do you remember that name? We met Helena way back in the lost city of Atlanta suck. And she is, if you'll remember, a character. Holy shit, is she a character? Madame uh, Blavatsky claimed to have met the ancient masters, the White Brotherhood, in the mountains of Tibet during this big spiritual journey of hers that she, I'm sure, never took, but the claims to have taken. And, and they shared long lost secrets with her, including what happened to the lost city of Atlantis. Uh, this is the lady who thinks that Atlantis sank as the result of actual battles between basically fucking wizards and magicians and dragons and ancient atomic bombs. It is way too much to get into here. If you want to, want to hear this crazy tale, re-listen to the Atlanta suck. Uh, Madame Blavatsky, David Icke level crazy. Decades after Madame Blavatsky's death in 1891, Guy W. Ballard, uh, guessing the W is for wackadoodle, decides to expand upon her teachings. Writing under the name of Godfrey Ray King, Ballard publishes a book in 1934 called Unveiled Mysteries, sharing knowledge he gathered at Mount Shasta from St. Germain. He claims to have received regular messages termed discourses from St. Germain and other masters after his initial encounter. One of the masters who talked to him was none other than Jesus Christ. Uh, yep, because of this, members of Ballard's new I Am movement would consider themselves to be Christian. Guy and his wife, Edna W. Ballard, also W for wackadoodle, claimed to have received more than 3,000 master messages during their lifetimes. Uh, which formed the body of the movement's teachings and still forms the, uh, the, the, the body of work today. The name I am is also Christian in origin. It's a reference to the Bible verse in which God replies to Moses, I am who I am, Exodus 3.14. The Ballards incorporated the I am movement in 1932, following Guy Ballard's death in 1935, or excuse me, 1939. Edna Ballard would become the movement's leader and she would reveal messages she would receive from St. Germain and other masters until her death in 1971. Uh, the board of directors, which had been established at the movement's incorporation in 1932, would then take control of the movement. They still control it today. Uh, since 1971, no further messages from masters have been received because no new messenger has been appointed to succeed the Ballards. So if you are looking to take over a new cult, right, or I guess it'd be an old cult, if you want to become a new cult leader, I think you should probably study up on St. Germain's teachings Go wander around Mount Shasta for a while, then claim to be the new conduit for St. Germain's messages, right? If you also have a few million dollars to pour into their cult, I would bet they would love to have you. I would bet you would get to lead them. So that's pretty fun. Um, so what info did St. Germain and other masters share with the Ballards? Well, the teachings emphasized ways for individuals to become aware of their I am or God presence, which flows from God, the mighty creative fire at the center of the universe. Ultimately, each person hopes to ascend into the divine realm as the Ballards are believed to have done at the end of their lives. Here's the message in their words. All should understand that when one has made his ascension, he becomes a wholly perfect being of such beauty and radiance that all who contact him realize that he is superior in every way to all other beings. He is no longer subject to any of the limitations of the outer world, for he has the full use of the power of precipitation, can take his body anywhere he desires instantly, 
transcend time and space and is such an outpouring of light, love, and peace that all who contact him know instantly that he is a God being manifesting marvelous perfection in every way. Where the physical body has red blood in the veins, at the movement of ascension, it becomes a liquid golden light, pouring its radiance through the flesh until the rays of golden light fill the aura. That's pretty fucking sweet. Become your own immortal God. That is the best religious sales pitch you can offer. Oh, your religion offers heaven. Oh, that's cute. Uh, we can build our own heaven. Why enjoy someone else's paradise when you can just run it? You can customize it. You can add more palm trees, a little less harp, uh, more titties, less robes, more high heels, less sandals. Be your own God. Uh, the reciting of decrees, invocations of the divine that call for the manifestation of the invis uh, in the visible world of a desired condition or the removal of an undesirable one is the primary devotional activity of members of the movement. So basically these people, they show up at these I am temples and they just fucking listen to messages recorded by the ballers. Uh, the I am movement also promotes uh, American patriotism. The messages received by Ballard suggest that the United States had a special role in the master's world plan. And members of the movement believed that Ballard was a reincarnation of George Washington. Is, is all of this making sense? I feel like I'm either not describing it very well or describing it perfectly. And it's just insane. Uh, as a result of some legal trouble in the 1950s, the movement lost a few members, quite a few members, almost died out. But as of just a few years ago, there were still apparently more than 300 chartered IM sanctuaries in the U.S. alone. No, I'm sorry, in the U.S. and world combined. Uh, the most prominent group inspired by the IM movement is the Church Universal, uh, Triumphant. They're believed to have between 30 and 50,000 members. My God, uh, there is still an IM temple just a few miles from Mount Shasta. Uh, 11, if you want to visit, I'm not making it, 1137 McLeod Ave, Mount Shasta, California. You can stop by. Also, Mount Shasta, the town, such a weird place. You can also go visit the Mount Shasta Goddess Temple Skydancer Center for Female Mysticism. That's a mouthful. You could take a, a woman's mysteries workshop. You could enroll in the woman shaman priestess training program if you have the, uh, the required genitalia. Uh, there's also a place in Mount Shasta called the Dolphin Star Temple Mystery School. I shit you not. <laughs> this, is, this town sounds, this town is only uh, about 3,000 people and it has an IM temple. It has a Skydancer Center for Female Mysticism. It has the Dolphin Star Temple Mystery School and, that, and that's just the few I could find quickly on the internet. Uh, at the Dolphin Hippie School, by the way, you can learn the universal teachings of the ancient mystery schools of Lemuria, Atlantis, and Egypt. I'm going I'm to be honest. The more I read about Mount Shasta, the more I want to have a vacation there. Uh, I actually have pulled over in that town on a few different road trips. And I, and I remember it being like a funky, artsy little new agey town with some cool coffee shops. I had no idea how weird it truly was. Uh, if you don't want to visit a temple, you can also stop by the Mount Shasta Crystal Room, where, uh, according to their website you will find beautiful crystals and minerals from all over the world. From the Murian seed crystals to magical gemstone jewelry, you will find tools for healing and museum quality specimens for your home or workplace. Are you getting a good feel for how fucking crazy this place is? Because I'm going to close out this suck with the weirdest national park mystery of them all, at least to me. Let's talk about Lemurians. I've hit, I've hit that word a few times now. Are Lemurians alive on Mount Shasta? Uh, there are many crystally types who believe that Mount Shasta is the home right now of Lemurians. They believe that Lemurians are living inside the mountain right now. Uh, Lemurians being the survivors of the sinking of the lost continent of Lemuria over 12,000 years ago, which never happened. People are alive right now. People living in California. People who own, probably own a lot more crystals than you do, who believe that a race of creatures called Lemurians are living in a subterranean city called Telos <laughs> inside of Mount Shasta. Now, who are Lemurians? In a word, fake. Uh, they're made up. They're, they don't, they're not real. Uh, the notion of, Lemurian, uh, of Lemuria comes from 1864. We know exactly where it comes from. That year, zoologist and biogeographer Philip Sclatter published The Mammals of Madagascar. He proposed that Madagascar and India had once been part of a larger continent that he called Lemuria. This is what he wrote. The anomalies of the mammal fauna of Madagascar can be best explained by supposing that a large continent occupied parts of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, that this continent was broken up into islands, of which some have become uh, amalgamated with Africa, some with what is now Asia, and that in Madagascar, 
and the Mascarene Islands, we have existing relics of this great continent for which I propose the name Lemuria. And he was right about Madagascar and India being part of another continent. It was a supercontinent called Pangaea. Uh, after his publication, wackadoodles like Madame Blavatsky connected Lemuria to Atlantis and just made up a new race of people out of thin air. And these people were assigned magical powers and a whole lot of other nonsense. Believing in Lemurians is the intellectual equivalent of believing in lizard people. Zero evidence, zero le legitimate academics or scientists <laughs> believe in this shit. Uh, here is the story, though, of how Lemurians arrived in Mount Shasta, taken from a very respected, incredible, and prestigious website called LemurianConnection.com, run by people who totally believe in these creatures. Prior to the sinking of their continent, fully aware of the eventual destiny of their beloved continent, the ancient Lemurians, using their mastery of energy, crystals, sound, and vibrations, hollowed out a vast underground city with the intention of preserving their culture, their treasures, and their records of ancient Earth's history. History that has been lost since the sinking of Atlantis. About 25,000 Lemurians were able to migrate into the interior of Mount Shasta, the most important of their various administration centers prior to the sinking of their motherland. I love how fucking far Mount Shasta is, by the way, from where this concert, this continent would have even been. Like, like why, if they were by like Madagascar and India, why the fuck would one of their administration centers be like literally clear across the world in Mount Shasta? Anyway, they say they are still here in physical immortal bodies, totally unlimited, living a life of pure heaven on earth. Wondrous little people, often referred to as the little people of Mount Shasta, are very often seen visually around the mountain. They are third dimensional beings like humans, but they live on a slightly higher level of the third dimension, such as third and one half level. And they will have, and they have the ability to make themselves visible and invisible at will. The reason they are not showing themselves physically to many people is because they have a collective fear of humans. At one time, when they were as physical as we are and could not make themselves invisible at will, humans living at the time viciously maligned them. They became so fearful of humans that they collectively asked the spiritual hierarchy of this planet for the dispensation to be elevated in their frequency. What in the fuck are these people talking about? So that they could make themselves invisible at will in order to be able to continue their evolution unharmed and in peace. Well, they, all right. Well, there you go. That's why you can't see me, guys. They're operating, they're operating on the third and one half level, you jackasses. That's probably the level Bigfoot operates on. That's probably the level that flat earthers operate on. That's why they get it. There is no curve to be seen when you're operating on that level. Well, uh, what a great way to rationalize just whatever you want. Hey, uh, where's your proof of these Lemurians? <laughs> proof? You want, you want proof? Good luck with that. They're operating on the 31 half level, motherfucker. They will be seen when and if they want to be seen. Do you not know how dimensions and levels work, you fucking idiot? God, I wish they really got that angry when you confronted them on it. Uh, according to the, it feels good to have a little bit of power back in my voice, by the way. I'm not going to lie. I love it when I can yell stuff like that. According to the Lemurian Connection website, there are also reports of the Bigfoot, <laughs> of course there's Bigfoots in this too. There are also reports of the Bigfoot race of people being seen on some remote areas of Mount Shasta along with many other mysterious beings. The Bigfoot people are now very few in numbers around the world and around Mount Shasta. They are of average intelligence and possess a peaceful heart. They have also obtained the dispensation to be able to make themselves invisible at will, to be able to avoid confrontation with us, and thus, like the little people, avoid being harmed, mutilated, and used as a slave race. What the fuck? I'm sorry, why is Bigfoot hiding? Because he doesn't want to be part of a slave race, jackass! It's obvious! First people see Sasquatches. Then they put him in zoos. Then they realize they're good at lifting shit and digging stuff. Then they're enslaved and building their cars and homes and shit! Wake up! What a strange explanation for why we can't find Bigfoot. Uh, but enough about Sasquatch. Let's talk more about the Lemurians. Uh, let's talk about their city inside Mount Shasta, where they live deep inside the mountain. They live in round houses and they enjoy unlimited health and wealth. It says, uh, these Lemurians are allegedly graceful and tall, seven feet and up with long flowing. If they're, if they're seven feet and up, why are they called the little people? I guess that's like ironic, like when you call a giant person tiny. Um, they dress in white robes and sandals, but they've also been seen in very colorful clothing. <laughs> no, they haven't. 
They are said to have long, slender necks and bodies, which they adorn with beautiful de decorative collars made of beads and precious stones. They have evolved their sixth sense, which enables them to communicate amongst themselves by extrasensory perception. They can turn invisible or teleport at will and speak the Lemurian language called Sol Solera Maru. <laughs> they also speak an impeccable English with a slight British accent. I swear to God, that's what they wrote. That's their actual description. Uh, they speak a, a English, but like with a slight British accent. The details, unreal. Uh, it feels like this mythology was created by somebody who read nothing but the Lord of the Rings and various Dungeons and Dragons fantasy books while also dropping acid and eating shrooms and smoking the most potent weed in existence on a daily basis for about a decade. And then were asked to quickly write down everything they thought to be true about the world. Uh, a man named Dr. M. Doriel, who was not a real doctor, uh, formed an offshoot of the IM movement called the Brotherhood of the White Temple. He claimed that he visited the, the Lemurians inside their mountain in the early 1940s. He said he uh, came to a space about two miles in height, about 20 miles long, 15 miles wide. He wrote that the light inside the mountain was as bright as a summer day because suspended almost in the center of the mountain is a giant sun thing. Uh, another mid 20th century mystic reported that he fell asleep on Mount Shasta and then was aw uh, awoke or awakened by a Lemurian who led him inside the mountain to a cave, which is paved with gold. Then the, the Lemurian told the man there was a series of tunnels left by volcanoes that were under the earth like freeways, a world within a world. Uh, the Lemurians supposedly have mastered atomic energy, telepathic and clairvoyant skills, electronics and science. Uh, they mastered all that stuff at least 18,000 years ago. They have technology that makes us surface dwellers look like toddlers compared to them. They control most of their technology with their minds. Uh, they have boats, planes, spaceships. They have a whole fleet of spaceships called the Silver Fleet. They come in and out of the mountain at will. They go out into space and do space stuff. Uh, they have, and we don't see them because they have the ability to make their vehicles invisible uh, whenever they feel like. Uh, and, and they do that because they don't want to be detected by the military, which makes no sense. Like, I love that they have all of this super advanced technology, like way more advanced than ours. They can teleport. They can turn invisible at will. They have all these other powers, but they're worried about us. But they're worried about our military. Get the fuck out of here. If they had all that stuff, they could just do whatever they wanted to us. Uh, a man named J.C. Brown, employed by the Lord Cowdray Mining Company of London, England, to prospect for precious metals around Mount Shasta, he claims to have found the Lemurians back in 1904. Apparently, he stumbled upon a tunnel which carved downward into the mountain, equipped with lanterns and miners' paraphernalia he set out to explore and later wrote. Three miles from the mouth of the tunnel, I struck across a cross-section containing gold-bearing ore and farther on, I struck another cross-section where an ancient race apparently had mined copper. He walked roughly 11 miles inside the mountain to where he found many rooms and chambers. The rooms were full of various plates, all inscribed neatly. The walls were lined with tempered copper and hung with shields and wall pieces made of gold. Some of the golden plates he found were engraved with certain drawings and hieroglyphics. Rooms opened into other chambers, one of which appeared to have been a place of worship. In addition, there were 13 statues made of copper and gold and a large sun design from which protruded golden streamers. The way the objects were strewn about, he had the feeling the occupants of the underground village had left on the spur of the moment. In one chamber, he counted 27 skeletons, the smallest of which was 6'6", six, six, the largest stretching out more than 10 feet. Two of the bodies were mummified, each clad in colorful, ornate robes. Brown spent many days exploring, studying the hieroglyphics, and, in, and, and printing them in his mind. I bet, this, I bet there was a tunnel that connected this city to the, uh, uh, the Grand Canyon City. And I'm guessing he must have brought some food and water. Must have found some bathrooms, you know, to, to explore this for so long. He was so excited about this great archaeological find, he decided to leave the tunnel and its contents exactly as he found them and come back later. But he concealed the entrance to the tunnel so well, he forgot where it was. Dagnabbit. Dagnabbit. I forgot where the magic tunnel was to the place that doesn't exist. And then after 30 years, he decided that the glory of these Lemurians and the golden artifacts still hanging untouched in his cavern must be shared with others. And in 1934, he's 79 years old, he appears in Stockton, California. He organizes a group of people to accompany him to explore Mount Shasta. Legend has it, he got 80 people, including a newspaper editor, a museum curator, a retired printer, several scientists, other citizens, to form a group to investigate the tunnel. And apparently they met nightly for six weeks to plan the expedition and also listen to his constant tales of lost continents, hieroglyphics, treasure, blah, blah, blah. And then the morning they were supposed to leave, uh, he's a fucking no-show. And they never saw him again. God, I hope that story is true. I hope that some Looney Tune making tons of crazy claims gathered people 
and lured them on for six weeks. And then the day they're supposed to leave, he just bounces. Uh, I'm surprised you don't hear about more doomsday cult leaders doing that. Like, tell everybody the day is going to be like April 1st, 2030. Get everyone in the compound, have sex with all the hot women for a couple of years, make other people do all the work, convince everyone that, you know, you're God's favorite prophet, take all their money. And then on like March 31st, you just bounce. Just leave a little note behind that says, April fools, motherfuckers. <laughs> Made it all up. There's no spaceship. It's nonsense. Best of luck. Some cult member. Ah, damn it, man. Ah, man, he got me good. He got me so good. Tricked me into giving me my, uh, giving him my wife for a couple years. Uh, tricked me into castrating myself and giving him all my money. Ha! <laughs> ah, you're the April Fool's king, Cummins. Okay, so that's it. That is it for today's uh, mysteries. Weird tales, right? Who knew there was so much going on in our national parks? And, and I know many of you wrote in suggesting like other mysteries, this mystery or that. There's way too many for one suck. Uh, that is why the Travel Channel did an eight-part series on, on the subject back in 2015. A series I haven't watched, by the way, so I don't know how much overlap there is. Uh, I'm sure they left out a lot of stories as well. I, I hope you enjoyed the ones I chose to focus on. I'm just amazed by what people choose to believe. And there was a lot of like legitimately interesting just mysteries. So let's go over some quick highlights. Learn a wee bit more uh, with today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one. On March 1st, 1872, then-President Ulysses S. Grant signed the Yellowstone National Park Protection Act, establishing Yellowstone Park as America's first federally protected land. Number two, the United States National Park System encompasses a total of 418 different sites that span across 84 million acres. The U.S. National Park System in total is over 10 million acres, bigger than all of Italy. Number three, there is not a lost Egyptian city hidden in the Grand Canyon. David Icke doesn't know what he's talking about. The whole story was a hoax, likely told to sell more newspapers in 1909. Number four, it is very likely that the legend of the cryptozoological creature Chupacabra can be traced directly back to one woman watching the movie Species in Puerto Rico in 1995. I love that so much. I, I, I wish that the legend of Bigfoot could be traced back to somebody watching uh, Harry and the Hendersons. Uh, no, number five, new info. Uh, I'm always intrigued by tales of people who vanish without a trace with no evidence left behind. It's so spooky. No body giant search party forms. They find absolutely nothing. Always makes me wonder about UFOs and like wormholes, you know, other dimensions we could possibly slip into. that haven't been proven to exist yet. Uh, we covered several disappearances like that today. Uh, they happen in all kinds of parks like the great smoky mountains national park. Uh, this park sits along the Tennessee and North Carolina border. Uh, covers over 187,000 acres of land, and that site has been home to so many disappearances over the years, like the case of Dennis Martin in 1969. At that time, Dennis, a six-year-old boy, and his family are on a hiking trip in the Smoky Mountains. Dennis and his three brothers decide to jump out at their parents when they walk past. The three brothers, you know, they, they race up ahead, uh, or the, the four brothers, actually, sorry. They race up ahead. Uh, three go one way. Dennis goes in another direction because he has a bright red top, which is going to make him more likely to be seen. He wants to hide a little better. When the time comes for everybody to jump, Dennis's three brothers jump out. Dennis does not. They assume that he just missed his cue. They call his name. They're waiting for him to come out. Nothing. His family looks for Dennis for hours. They can't find a trace of him. They, ugh, that'd be such a nightmare. They call for a search and rescue unit and a search party uh, is formed. They look for Dennis for weeks. 1,400 searchers comb a 56 square mile area. Uh, they find a few people who reported seeing a small boy wander through the woods. Others reported uh, uh, various small items of clothing, but Dennis himself, no real trace of him is ever found. Many think he was kidnapped or dragged off by some animal, but it's all speculation. He vanished without a trace. To this day, no one knows exactly what happened to Dennis. And he is just one of many people to disappear forever inside of our national parks. Just more national park mysteries. Time suck. Top five takeaways. All right, so that is, uh, that is it. National Park Mysteries has been sucked. Hail Nimrod. Uh, may he protect the rest of us from uh, invisible and, and nefarious forces. Maybe Lemurians are taking people. I don't know. Um, thank you to the Time Suck team. Thank you to Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, High Priestess of the Suck, Harmony Velikamp, Jesse Guardian of Grammar Dobner, Reverend Dr. Joe motherfucking Paisley, Time Suck High Priest Alex Dugan, the guys of Elixir, Danger Brain, and Axis Apparel. Uh, next week, we're going back to a cult. Haven't done that in a bit. Uh, touched on a cult today, digging a lot deeper on a cult next week, the Order of the Solar Temple. 
On October 4th uh, and 5th, 1994, 53 members of the Solar Temple in Canada and Switzerland were murdered or committed suicide. The buildings in which they died were set on fire. A year later, another 16 members killed themselves and five more died in similar ways in March of 1997. This cult was based in Switzerland, and they saw themselves as following the teachings of the Knights Templar. Longtime suckers know all about the Knights Templar. Uh, the followers of cult leader Joseph DeMambro were brainwashed to believe that he was a member of the 14th century Christian order of the Knights Templar in a previous life, and that his daughter, Emmanuel, was the cosmic child, and they would be led uh, to a planet which orbits the star Sirius after their deaths. Are you in? I, I hope you're in, because this sounds fucking insane. Uh, I love a cult suck. There is no limit to what some people can be convinced to believe. Uh, we learned that today again. Uh, time now to hear from some of you, to hear from our very own cult members, the Cult of the Curious, with today's Time Sucker Updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker Updates. First update is a fun story and a shout out request coming in from Adrian Riddle. Sorry, I can't get to all the shout out requests, by the way. We get quite a few and we're very grateful that we do. Sometimes the one that gets read on the show is just the one that happens to come in when I'm putting the updates together and curating it. Uh, it's never personal if you do not get in. Uh, Adrian writes, Dear Master Sucker, first of all, thank you for all you do with the Time Suck podcast and your stand up comedy. You are a legend, sir. I'm writing today to tell you a little bit about my incredible husband, Keith. He introduced me to Time Suck a couple of months ago, and I was hooked instantly. Keith and I are both recovering addicts who met at the lowest point in both of our lives. We were at rehab, uh, both freshly out of toxic relationships, both having no idea how we were going to move forward with our lives. Everyone told us our relationship would never work. Uh, we were just the same old run-of-the-mill rehab romance, and it was probably best that we go our separate ways as soon as we get out. Or got out, but we didn't. We stayed together, we went to meetings together, and figured out how to have a healthy life together. Fast forward six years and we now have two beautiful daughters together. And he has all but officially adopted my older daughter as his own. Oh, that, I love hearing that. It's beautiful. Uh, our careers are thriving and we are closing on our first house in a few short weeks. Keith works so hard to be the best dad he can uh, to, to our little, little girls. He loves them and me with everything he has. He gets up and goes to work at 5 a.m. so that he can be off in time to get them all from school and daycare. He's at every dance recital, choir concert, event, cheer, every event, cheering them on with stars in his eyes. I love him. He's a beautiful meat sack, and I couldn't ask for a better partner to go through life with. His birthday was last week, and I surprised him with tickets to your stand-up show in Dallas. We're from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we can't wait to come see you live. Thanks again for all you do. We are constantly making time suck jokes at each other. What is big deal? And uh, your podcast has brought us even closer than we already were. If you could, could you please give him a shout-out from me, I would be so happy. Looking forward to seeing you in Dallas. Hail Nimrod, Adrian. Well, hail Nimrod, Adrian. Uh, man, see you in Sweet Keith. Fuck yeah, I'll give you a shout out, Sweet Keith. You sweet little minxy meat sack, you. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you in Dallas. Love your story. Love that you defied the odds. I love an underdog story. You know I love an underdog story. Uh, good on you two for being kick-ass meat sack parents. World needs more of that. World can never get enough of that. Good on you both. Uh, got a lot of messages regarding the pedophile island suck. You know, we still getting, still getting a lot of those. Um, uh, I mean, it just speaks to how, how big the problem of sexual abuse really is. And it's not just man against child. Uh, it's sometimes, you know, women are the perpetrators that sometimes gets lost in the, uh, talk about pedophilia. And, uh, so in regards to that, I'm reading this message made, uh, sent in by an anonymous sucker who writes, dearest master sucker, I have never, ever fucking once told anyone about this. If you do happen to read this, please keep me anonymous. Done. I am an adult male, and when I was six, I was molested by two of my female babysitters. I had no clue how to react. I still don't really know how to feel. It was so hard to keep it from my family, who still don't know, and tell my mom that I didn't want them to babysit me anymore. I made up lies. My mother could tell that I was a little uncomfortable and never hired them again. I couldn't tell friends, ever. You try to tell any young boy that you had two naked 17-year-old girls on top of you and touching you like you've never been touched before. It sounds like every boy's dream, but not at six. Not when I just wanted to fucking play Nintendo. I haven't seen either of them in well over a decade, and that's cool. There are still times where my best living thing in the world wife says something that they said during the act, and it still gets to me. Almost an immediate soft shamecock. I tell her I have hangups, but I cannot bring it 
to myself to tell her. It hurts to think about. But listening to everybody write to you about their instances has finally given me the courage to tell someone or thousands, ha ha ha. I love you guys and all that you do. You make us laugh. You teach us and so much more. I hope you know that. Fuck that. I know you do. I know that telling this story these days doesn't do much about them doing it in the first place, but it does bring a little bit of relief to me to type these words for the first time. Hail Nimrod, praise Bojangles and Triple M, and praise Luc Lucifina. She would have a field day with those two pieces of shit. Sorry if I rambled. Well, you didn't ramble. Uh, nothing to apologize about. Lucifina would have a field day with those two pieces of shit because she loves sexuality, healthy sexuality, hates those who defile, which would always be such a beautiful and pleasurable act. Uh, and I hope you are able to tell your wife someday. I really do. I bet she would understand. I, I bet telling her would be a weight off your chest. You're anonymous, but you know you know that I've met you, and uh, and I don't think someone as amazing as you would marry someone who isn't also amazing. So thanks for sharing that. I hope you feel a little better. Never ever feel at fault, you or anybody else listening, when you're the victim of sexual abuse. Not ever. It's, the shame should never be felt by anyone other than the abuser. You were a kid. You did fucking absolutely nothing wrong. Okay. Uh, apparently, I got time sucker Kyle Prulier. Thank you for, for the pronunciation guide. Your name? I would have fucking called you Prulhair. Uh, with the Casey, Casey Anthony lie. Uh, so glad my voice is back, by the way. Uh, whenever I think of that Casey Anthony thing. Kyler writes, or sorry, I added Kyler because of my son. Kyle writes, long time Kyler, first time listener, you asshole. I pride myself on outsmarting your made up rants in the show. I even wrote in earlier claiming how I figured out you're making up a sponsor even before you get to the sponsor. But you son of a bitch, you got me. When you said Casey mother of the year Anthony was running a daycare, I screamed. <laughs> I screamed out loud to nobody. Are you fucking kidding me? And I got so mad that I almost threw my phone at the window. <laughs> Followed immediately by me also yelling at no one uh, in particular, you son of a bitch, when you corrected yourself. Your dunce cap wearing spaces are Kyle Prulier. I love it, Kyle. And no dunce cap for you. No one is more gullible than I am. I would, I would fall for every single one of my lies if I wasn't the one telling him. Uh, I, I'm ridiculously gullible. Uh, Hail Nimrod, dude. And now a funny message sent in from Time Sucker Kelly Daniels. Kelly says, I fucking love you. Until I stumbled upon your podcast, which I listened to religiously, I wanted to jab myself in the eye with a pen. On the other hand, your unhealthy admiration with Michael motherfucking McDonald is concerning. Why? Why are you so obsessed with him, Becky? It's weird. It is weird, which is why I'm obsessed with him. I keep forgetting that he has the best voice in history. I keep forgetting that he sings like he has marbles in his mouth. Um, and then she says, and fuck the haters who get mad when you mispronounce words and names. I love it because it makes me feel superior to your dumb ass. <laughs> Keep on sucking, Kelly. Kelly, I'm glad you feel superior. I, I really am. Uh, it's good to be humble and accept your shortcomings instead of, uh, you know, being embarrassed. Yeah, I don't speak very well, uh, which is super ironic considering what I do. And I feel like, I, I hope it's inspirational, honestly. I feel like if I can make a living as a comic and podcaster, when I barely speak one language then all of you meat sacks should be able to kick ass doing whatever you do, doing whatever you're passionate about. Love you guys. And uh, last, last update, I believe. I'm making sure it is the last one. Yes. Uh, last update uh, regarding Casey Anthony, coming in from sucker Michaela Perkins. Uh, Michaela writes, Dear Reverend Dr. Master Suckmaster, <laughs> Hail Nimrod. I love your podcast first and foremost. Love it so much. I got my husband into it. Now we suck on these wonderful, delicious time suck episodes together. Mm. I have some quick updates. I'd like to share with you. I just listened to your Casey Anthony suck and thought you would find this interesting. Apparently, she is advocating for those who are wrongfully convicted and her first case is Scott Peterson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I read about that. Uh, if that's not fucked up, I don't know what is. Uh, another, suck did, uh, uh, another sucker update I have for you is about the Unabomber. I'm currently listening to a podcast called Monster and season two is all about the Zodiac Killer. I heard on the podcast that there is a group of amateur sleuths who have dedicated their lives into finding out who the real Zodiac Killer is. On this podcast, they interviewed several of these people, and many of them think that the Unabomber was indeed the Zodiac Killer, uh, good old um, uh, Ted Kaczynski at his finest. I thought you would find these interesting and wanted to hear your thoughts. Well, Michaela, uh, I did look into the Unabomber Zodiac Killer connection, and while it's interesting, it's highly unlikely. Uh, Kaczynski did live in the Bay Area from 1967 to 1969, uh, or, you know, he lived for a little while in that period, you know, the same period that the Zodiac's uh, confirmed killers, uh, killings occurred. Kaczynski did once sign a high school yearbook with a symbol similar to the Zodiac's. However, witness descriptions of a paunchy 
Zodiac, like a little thicker Zodiac, do not match the very lanky at the time Kaczynski. Also, a bloody print from one of Zodiac's, uh, from one of the Zodiac slain scenes that was recovered does not match Ted Kaczynski's prints. And once Ted became the Unabomber, none of his writings match the Zodiac uh, writings in any way. Very, very highly unlikely for a sudden personality and handwriting shift. Um, uh, and obviously his MO of bombing was different than the Zodiac. Um, as for the Casey Anthony Scott Peterson connection, uh, she also talked about how she feels similar to OJ Simpson. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, she feels, you know, she's, she's one of these wrongly accused Scott Peterson, OJ Simpson, blah, blah, blah. Um, of course, she's attracted to these cases. She's a manipulator who, who wants to sell people around her on stories that make her look better. And being falsely accused is the story that makes her look the best right now. She loves to play the victim. Uh, truly disgusts me. And then Michaela finishes with, again, love the podcast. My husband and I are hoping and waiting for you to come to Boise to get a chance to meet you. We are fellow Idahoans like you and love this wonderful, beautiful state. Take care of that voice. Pet Bojangles on the head. Give the queen of the sucks some pretty flowers. Oh, that's nice. And hail Nimrod. Your space is her, Michaela Perkins. Uh, thank you, Michaela. I would love to get to Boise. I am, I'm going to try. Hopefully this next year. I do think it's crazy. I don't, I don't play the biggest city in my own state. Uh, but for whatever reason, it's, it has just never worked out. Never been able to find the right kind of venue there. Hopefully that changes in 2020. Uh, keep spreading the suck, and it will. I, I go generally where the analytics say I have the most fans, and I would love to see those tick up in Boise and uh, and get down to a show there. It's where my sister lives. It would be great. And thank you for the updates, everybody. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks again, uh, everyone, for listening and supporting Time Suck. Uh, love you, Meat Sacks. Please don't disappear in a national park or anywhere else this week. I don't want to lose any listeners. And also keep away from Lemurians. Uh, I don't trust anybody who can teleport and turn invisible. And most importantly, uh, keep on sucking. You ready to move to Mount Shasta? Yeah, do you want to teleport really quick? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Teleport now? Uh, yeah. Okay, think about it. Okay. I didn't...